I'm going to call the meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. Are there any amendments or deletions to the agenda for this evening? I have one amendment. I have a question. I'll first make a motion to approve the agenda that may be amended. Someone second it. Nobody wants to say it. Second. So, All in favor? Aye. Aye. So, um, under the <clears throat> policy committee um, first reading, the amendments to the grading policy. I just want to make a statement here. I'd really like to see this to be held up because four years ago, I believe it was four years ago, the administration went to make a change in the grading system. It took me and a group at the middle school and high school some two plus years to come up with a grading system. It went out to the complete public. It was some 400, if you recall, um, parents surveys and student surveys um, into. This was a really big topic. I know everybody's proud that we got an award last week or two weeks ago about being this great board or whatever. Um, but back in the day, you know, the previous middle schools and high school board had a lot of things in front of us that were very controversy. And this was one of them. And for me to open up um, an agenda a couple of weeks ago to see that the policy for grading is up for some changes without um, going to the public. Um, I, I just don't get why we're here at our first meeting. I'm not against changes, I mean, because first of all, that was a change. But I think we really, unless you folks want to as a board, face this again of what a middle school and high school faced some four or five years ago. Terry, you were there as a teacher. Roger, you were there as a board member. Jen, you were there. Sherry, you were there. I mean, are we a group that um, is supposed to be um, transparent on such a big topic? It seems like we spend a lot of time on some other things, but nobody in this room here really understands what it took to come to this grading um, piece. So I would like to see it drop. I understand there are people that wouldn't, so I'm asking, I'll, I'll make a motion to drop that. If it fails the motion, you know, I'll continue on when we get to that reading. That's all. So I make a motion to drop the um, grading policy based on, I don't believe it's been um, warned out to the public enough at this time. If I don't get a second, I understand it fails. So if you want to move ahead, good. Then I'll wait until the first reading of the grading policy. So the motion is on the floor. Nobody, if nobody seconds it. I, I'd like to ask a question. Is, is, is Jim incorrect and in what, or was it noted to the public? And, and if so, in what way? Well, it's been on the agenda of the policy committee and the yep. policy committee has had a the, the, the policy committee and the report for the committee. Well, I, I second. I see no reason reason not for the policy um, for the policy meeting appropriately. Yeah, I second Jim's yeah. motion. So, so now that we have a second, I'd like to start a conversation on it. Yeah, Jim, do, do, can we wait until we get to the policy part of the meeting? Well, I'd like to have it drop right now. That's that's. I guess I have a second, so you can call the vote. And, if you folks don't we want can, to, we could discuss this part of it. This one motion so right now. You know. I mean, I, you know, to say that something that was so huge, and I'm sorry, folks, I, I've been on this board, I think it's somewhere between 12 and 15 years on um, the middle school, high school, probably the longest standing in here. Um, but what we went through at middle school and high school, it was horrible. And um, to come out and say, that it was warned in a public hearing with policy 
when I have other people that don't even know where they went to look and they have no idea what I'm talking about because when they go to open up the policy, I'm a board member. I had to get permission to find out from you all. Well, well, that okay. <laughs> that only is because when I posted them, I didn't give. It was my area in, in on Google Sheets. That's all it was, and I gave it to you right away. And I subsequently realized that you have to, when you post it, you you have to leave it so that everybody has. That was not intentional, and as soon as I. I'm not saying it's yeah, but, but that's saying, all. And and I, every, I'm every, just saying that you said that you wanted it. It was in the meetings and everything, but nobody has it out in front of them. I'm not going to sit here and argue. Well, I just I, I made a motion at second. Just call the vote. And we'll go from there. Well, Ben. Yeah, it uh, seems like I mean I understand there was more public notice and public involvement on the prior version, uh, but this was duly warned. It was it's been worked on by the policy committee and voted forward for a reading. I'd say let's discuss the merits when it gets there. And if there's changes to the policy or merits to the policy that you know, need to be worked on, then let's talk about them. But to declare some policy a sacred cow that we can never touch or talk about it. Whoa, 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 whoa. Nobody said it was a sacred cow. You're, you're, you're trying to take it off the agenda. No, someone said what I'm saying here is, is that the process of putting it forward is not correct. What do you mean? It was properly warned. Okay. I'm not going to argue with you that way. Just call it. I think I had two requests to uh, to share the document, which I did. And then I realized, oh, oh I you know, I didn't use Google Sheets correctly. I should have, when I cut and pasted it, I needed to do another drop down that said that everybody. And then I, I think, that, I think, I think nobody's listening to me. You had two requests from two board members. You did, the public is not aware of it, that you're looking to change the policy grading system in some way and form. And fine, <clears throat> call the vote. That's all I said. I always, I, I, I'm a big boy. If I don't get my way, I don't get my way. It's okay. Comment? Comment? Yes, Todd. I just think it, it, unless there's a reason that it's going to really ruin the policy commission's day, if we could just postpone it till the next meeting. And then I think that Jim can work with you guys since he was out also. And I've had COVID brain as well, personally. Um, it'd be great if we can just really get it out there in a big way to satisfy what Jim's saying. And then then this won't be an issue at, at the next meeting in this regard. But if it's something that's so time sensitive, then I'd like to know that. But if it isn't, that's why I support Jim's motion, just because what's what's an extra four weeks when we can, if the public really doesn't know. On the survey we did, a lot of folks say they don't know what's going on. And, and we know that we do our best to let them know in the ways we do, but we know we can always do better. So I look at this as just a potential opportunity to show what a transparent board we are and live up to our standards. But again, if there's a if there's a time sensitive detrimental effect, then let's just hear it. But I, I don't that's I don't find it contentious to put it off if, if that's what we're talking about until the next meeting personally. So what I don't understand is why can't it be a first reading with the intention that we discuss it now? Because you're you're basically saying we can't discuss it tonight. And I'm saying, when we discuss it, and if it's back to the drawing board, and that's what the first reading says, then we take it back. But I otherwise, said, I want to cut this short. I expect my motion to fail. I make a statement. I'm here for the voters in the town of Queens. I make my statement. I expect it to fail. Could you please take the vote? So I'm on record of stating underneath um, changing the amendments. I think we wasted too much time on this. I'd like to hear a motion to fail. And have a vote. That's all. All right, I'm going to call for a vote. Uh, Jim, could you restate your motion, please? I would like to have um, committee updates B policy, first reading one, amendments to grading policy, policy to be removed from tonight's meeting. The motion was seconded by Todd. Um, those who are in favor of Removing that item from the agenda, from the policy agenda, uh, please say aye. 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 Do we Are there have any ask, ask any questions or have a discussion, or we're just moving this to a vote? I, oh. I think we'll just bring it to a vote because we do have time to discuss it later. If if this is not deleted by our yes vote. Okay, my vote is an aye. 
Are there any uh, against? Nay. 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 I think Nay. Have, yeah, I think I have to call, call for a roll call. A roll call. So an, a yes vote says okay. take it off. A no vote says keep it on the agenda. So Anna? Wait, Raina, do you want to call it? Sherry, what do you mean by call it? Like call people by name? Yes, and that way we can make sure that we have everyone here and record response. Do you, how would you like to say it? <laughs> Thanks, she's calling. Not sure if that was a yes or no from the dog. <laughs> I guess just do a roll call, right? Yeah, sorry about that. My husband just got home from work. Dogs <laughs> are announcing it. Um, <laughs> Do you want, uh, Carrie, do you want to just go through and then if you miss anybody, they can speak up, but I do need them to state their names. Okay, I, I can call the names. Okay, I'll start first with the people on Zoom. Anna? I would like to vote to have a discussion, whichever way that is. So that would be a no? Then it's a no for me. Bob, Cream? No. Adam? We can't hear you. <laughs> He's motioning yes with his thumb. Okay, so you're saying yes to, re to remove it from the agenda. Okay. Ray? Ray doesn't get the job. No. Well, we've listened uh, to <laughs> I'm going to say uh, I would like to have more discussion so i'm a yes okay todd yes lara no um sam uh i'm a nay no because i want to have more discussion which i believe way was saying he was a no because he wants to have more discussion but anyways i want to have more discussion so no okay <laughs> PJ, yes. Okay, yes means you want this removed tonight for tonight. Yes. Uh, Lydia, no. Jim, yes. No. Bryce, and Ben, no. Elliot, no. Okay. So how many how many votes do we have right now? The motion fell like six to four, whatever. Can you tell me how Bryce voted? I couldn't hear him. No. No, you can't tell her. And I'm a no. All right, so that is five yeses. One, two, three, four, nine no's. Okay. We will continue that discussion then later. Also, I'm going to amend the agenda to move um, 5C, the FERPA training, to 5A. I'll second that. Thank you. And there will be an executive session. Okay. Are all in favor of those things? Aye. Okay, thank you. All right, we now have public comment. If you could raise your Zoom hand or your um, your your hand here live. Uh, John Spector. Uh, thanks, Sherry. I'm John Spector uh, from Woodstock. Um, I'm a member of the Economic Development Commission, and I know that um, that at some point, I'm not not I don't I'm not sure I understand all of the items on the agenda, but at some point. Uh, soon you'll be discussing or may be discussing whether or not to offer child care uh, and particularly after school child care. And I just wanted to say that um, the Economic Development Commission has set as one of its priorities for Woodstock the expansion of child care capacity. We think it's really important for the town and we think it's uh, it's significant um, in in our economic development in terms of people come wanting to move here, being able to move here or not moving away. And we have good examples of people who are moving and considering moving out because they can't get childcare. Um, we have um, 
so I just want to convey to you that there would be, I think, strong support from the community in Woodstock, although I know there are Woodstock members on your board who can, can you know, who can discuss that um, for, for some type of involvement of the public schools. We know that you have great expertise, you have terrific facilities um, and uh, that already exist to leverage that. And I just want to make you aware that the would at least from Woodstock's perspective, we have a funding that we are currently considering making grants to the current providers who have given us some terrific proposals for expanding their capacity. And we absolutely would consider if the schools wanted to uh, offer child care or expand child care programs, we could absolutely consider um, you know, providing some type of startup funding for you as well if there were costs that you had to incur that if otherwise you wouldn't be able to do it. I don't know whether you're allowed to take our money or not. We we know that we're allowed to give it to you. So um, I just wanted to make all of you aware of that opportunity. I'm sure this is an issue you have and will continue to carefully consider. Thank you. Thank you. Anna, your hand is up. Did you have something? Not at this time, thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, we'll move on now to the next item on the agenda, which are the reports. Starting with the superintendent. I'm going to be brief. I know we have a lot of presentations tonight. The one piece I wanted to highlight from my report was the um, second annual Student Leadership Summit on Social Action. We had over 70 students at the Killington Grand Hotel. We wrote a grant. Um, students planned, organized, and facilitated this day-long conversation around issues of equity. Um, we had Dr. Liddell Brown there. We had other community members there um, for the purpose of students creating their own manifesto on equity. And that's they're currently um, collecting the information, creating the document, and hopefully we'll be presenting to the board and our local community. So it was a great day, exciting opportunity to see them take the charge, and they truly facilitated the whole event. So that's my report. Thank you. Um, Russ? Good evening, everyone. Um, I'll be really brief as well. Um, the two pieces that I wanted to highlight um, from technology were uh, we released an RFP for wiring of a number of our elementary school buildings. So Killington, Barnard, Woodstock Elementary, and Reading Elementary School. Uh, we received three, uh, three vendors expressed interest and two responded. And so we're in the process of weighing those bids. Um, and we hope to settle on a vendor in the next month or so and have that work start. Um, in the end of December. Um, so this is a project which will rewire those buildings, um, increase the amount of wireless coverage within the buildings and provide outdoor wireless access. Um, and this is a project that's funded through ESSER. Um, and then lastly, our state reporting has begun. So we um, are in the process of preparing our state reports and submitting them to the state. So this is my updates. I have a question. Yes, sure. Go ahead. Um, let's go back to um, counting of pupils. Mm -hmm. um, if a student lives in town, but the parents pay to go out to a private school, shouldn't that be a counted students for the town still or the district? No, no, it doesn't count. Yeah, that's not part of the formula, unfortunately. Um, it is different for Pittsfield. So Pittsfield has a different mechanism. So in Pittsfield, those students that the town pays to go to uh, a Vermont private school do count. So those are the only ones that do. Yeah, I just mean every time the parents were moving and saying that their kids were going to go to school, that money really had to go back to where they really live. Yeah. Adam, do you have a question? Can you hear me? Yes. I just I actually wanted to go back to uh, Sherry and a question for Sherry in the superintendent's report. Can we have an update about the status of after school programming? We had a, a small update uh, a month ago at our last board meeting about working with the community classroom. Um, and I'd like to get an update about after school programming and um, the efforts that are being made to, to address that. Yes, let me just, I'm going to pull it up on my cell phone so I don't. So I did have a report out from today from Aaron Boucher, who is our um, uh, coordinator for after school programming. He's been working with um, our community based activities, but he talked about he since the beginning of the school year has been posting the job school spring 
He's been working with the Vermont Department of Labor and Community College of Vermont. He's also been posting the positions on Trump Court's forum um, and has only had two or three uh, candidates from those multiple um, sites that he's been searching for individuals. Um, they were not able to take the position as offered. And so he's referred them to the community classroom that's based in Woodstock. Um, he's also will be covering for Killington. Their program director will be out for three weeks. He's been doing other employee outreach, uh, reaching out to parents, registration, setting up platforms. One of the challenges is that in our two smallest schools, um, based on the searches that he's had, there have been 10 students from Reading and 10 students from Barnard that uh, parents were interested in after school care. So we, he's been doing recruiting. He has not had any viable candidates. Um, he's been also supporting the work of the Woodstock Christian Child Care and their programming and the community campus. Um, community campus, um, Woodstock Christian Child Care has um, is working to increase the size of their facility to 28 children and they're pending um, meeting with a fire marshal. TCC is currently serving 32 students per day um, and also um, increasing their capacity for five more students. My understanding is that they, and I noticed that they've been posting in local uh, listservs that they have capacity there. Um, at this point in time, um, that's as far as we've been able to move. Again, the, the major issue, no matter where we post and, and how we've searched, we have not been able to find viable candidates to accept those positions as we have them. Uh, Todd? And then Jim? As someone who's worked 300 hours in the last two months on this, that's just fake news because none of those things are true. They all rely on outside, out of their control, funding mechanisms. WCCC is not in a position to add people tomorrow. TCC is not in a position to add people tomorrow. Rainbow's not in a position. Bridgewater's not. The facts are incorrect, fully and wholeheartedly incorrect. There are people that can't get in now, and we are letting them down by not having programming at West, where we have infrastructure that's paid for, as Chair Spector mentioned in public comments, you cannot fill positions for $18 an hour for a 15 hour work week. What we are doing separately to help facilitate this is helping to increase wages, increase healthcare benefits so that the private sector community places, the ones that you mentioned can go and bring these things forth, but they are not happening now. So to say, the statistics, Sherry, all due respect of capacity and availability is wholeheartedly incorrect. Chair Bristow is the chair of the CCC, which is a religious organization that some people aren't comfortable with. Some people are, and we want to help them and everybody. But to say there's capacity and they're going to add 20 kids and do this and that, I've been working on this for months, and it's just wholeheartedly hinged on so many things that are up in the air. I feel like it's disingenuous to speak those facts and figures to the board. It's it's wrong. It's just wrong. So it's not it's not eighteen dollars an hour, Todd. It's twenty and twenty five dollars an hour. And even those positions, we have positions in the teaching, in the building, in the paraeducators. Sherry, 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 Sherry. Sherry with all due respect, I'm you just said that. They, no, I am talking. You just said that you you just said they have twenty new children. You just said they have five slots available. You said this stuff, it's not true. They have to build you're a playground. You're calling me a liar, Todd, so I'm please. saying your information is incorrect please. as you're presenting it to the board. That's what I'm hey, saying. point of order, point of order. Can we, can, point of order, this, uh, why, why this is being handled is not, let's lower voices, let's respect each other the way we talk to each other. Point of order, this is not how the board should be running. Okay? We need to have facts, not- Facts are fine, but yelling? And uh, talking really over one another is not the way to get this done. Okay, so everyone gets a turn to speak. Water, it's Robert's rule. All right, Jim. So the town of Killington, about four years again, um, saw that we had an issue with the after-school program, and uh, believe that the district is trying to work to get it. 
what the town of Killington ran into at the time was is that to offer this job out at the 15 hours was not possible and no no benefits or whatever. So what the town of Killington did was we created a part-time recreation director and we went out and then piggybacked to the school to become that this the, this town hires a full-time rec director. The rec director then works and is the main person who was Sarah um, for the um this position, excuse me, folks, I was in a car, so my mind is like spinning around or whatever. That's why I haven't been here for two months. But the town of Killington went ahead and moved forward with this. It works, okay? It's, people want 40 hour a week jobs. They want the benefits. The town was able to give benefits, actually better than the school benefits. So, um, you know, it works. And we've had Sarah who resigned because she was taking on a different job in France, God bless her. And we've already hired another person that will start. I think some of the towns need to keep thinking outside the box, like, you know, talks, talking about it, whatever, trying to get together, and maybe work it through your rec slash whatever. It, it's a great way of putting um, a town and a district together. Bryce and then Ben. Um, just on this topic, do you think that I can ask, would it be appropriate to have Ellen and Aaron work for us just this year? Last a little year? Um, Come together with some kind of, because the, the, what Jim's mentioning, rec rec we've talked about, I talked about in Burnley, but I haven't had any capacity to take it on myself as a volunteer. Um, we also have the, the school district north of us that has after school programming in all their schools. Um, that he met with the, the ex you know, director that I, I set him up with. Um, but I haven't heard anything back from him. So I just don't know if like in next meeting or something, maybe it'd be appropriate for Aaron to come and give a presentation, discuss a little bit more instead of you having to read notes that he, that he sent you or, or something. That's that's my mess, but I don't expect the answer now. So Ben? Yeah, I mean, this has come up in the context of, of the superintendent status report. I don't think that's appropriate. I mean, this is a very, very complex topic, right? This is something that we need to potentially form a, a task force or working group to address, right? And Todd, really appreciate all the work that you've done on this and the capacity of the Economic Development Committee and all the communication that you've done. But we really need to bring that into the fold uh, as a board, come up with some work product that we can actually uh, present and vote on, right? Instead of kind of, you know, getting little bits and pieces here. Um, so I guess that would be my suggestion is that we table this discussion organize the content, uh, put some brain power to it and come back. Can I, can I just respond? So we uh, modeling after the Killington program, because it's one of the few programs in our district that have over the years been financially rigorous. That's why we're working with a community classroom. They have the staff, they have the location. It's a very similar model. They're working to come on board. What happened and what we've asked them to do, and, and Marlene is on the board, is to consider how they can also support rating and wire. So trying to use those community structures, we have a successful model in this district. It is not happening at a pace that we would like it to be, and it's really concerning and frustrating for families. I absolutely understand, but I we are really trying to partner with outside groups, and TCC has been a willing partner. They want to do that with us. It takes time, and time is is really challenging. Right. No, I just have... Jim? You know, the... the... The town of Killington didn't use the school board to fill this position. And luckily, like for the town of Killington, I sit on this, but I am a select board member for the town of Killington. And it was an idea that came out of a select board. We hire the person. We then charge that 15 hours times whatever the rate is. And that's how it works. So all I'm saying is that sometimes we can't just always beat up on the school. You got to remember your town is your town and you have to take care of your elementary schools and stuff in your own town also. You can't keep coming here and beating up, you know, the district. We have to take care of our individual towns also. Thank you. Uh, Sam? Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Um, I'm really thankful that there's so many people that are passionate about this because it is a really important um, 
topic. And I know that there's so many people in town who um, are working towards hopefully finding a solution. And I think that, um, like Ben said, um, continuing this conversation um, at a later point point and that you know I, I'm thankful Todd for you for doing all this work that you had like you said 300 hours on this and getting this information and knowing things and I just think it's important though that we're you know respectful within the meeting and talking and taking turns talking to each other and listening and that's the only way we're gonna come to a solution not by you know doing raising our voices and things like that so um that's that's just what I wanted to add to it. Adam and then Todd. Yeah, I, I just um, two things. Um, I guess I, I want to point out if I hadn't asked this question, we wouldn't have been talking about this tonight. You know, Ben, you raised that this isn't an appropriate form in terms of the superintendent's report, but we we have a hired position to oversee after school programming and have for a year and a half now, um, and we are still in the same boat. And I absolutely understand. Um, the employability aspect of this, but this is this is a position that we have hired and we're paying someone to do in our district, but it's not it's not covering our whole district, um, and, and so I th I think there needs to be more transparency about that, and um, I I think that that's really important to think about. Thanks. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Todd. Yeah. I, yeah. I I apologize for raising my voice, but when I hear someone that works for us, like Superintendent Sherry Souza, who I really admire as a person and as a professional, say things that are misleading, it really upsets me. And I can blame some of it on the COVID brain, but I can blame some of it on, I just hear in these school board meetings, statistics and this and that all day long, and student outcomes and all this. And I know my personal experience in two years in Woodstock in with my children in the school has been negative. And I know that families have come to me and talked about this issue. So I'm not gonna go and sit at a meeting and be kumbaya when I hear someone say something that's fundamentally not true. And I'm upset about it because I know it's untrue. So when I hear a superintendent say to this board, facts and figures, I think ad infinitum, it's perfect. And I don't need to research it. I don't need to fact check it. This isn't the Drudge Report. This is our union. And I'm telling you that 75% of the things just said, if you go back, were incorrect. A TCC doesn't have a teacher right now to take on these children. WCCC can't take more people tomorrow. Rainbow can't. Like we're working to give them the funds needed and doing this as quickly as possible so that they can do these expansions. But to have taxpayers have already paid for infrastructure, heating, building, all the things that happen at West, which is a top tier, amazing physical location and filled with all these things. To have my taxpayers and all the people in Woodstock, Sam included, anyone who represents Woodstock, to have our taxpayers have to go and just supplement a church setting, a religious setting, and these other places that aren't in the town. We're looking at Bridgewater. We're looking everywhere to help this problem for Woodstock people and beyond. It's right there. The golden thing's right there. We need to hire two positions and we haven't spent the time to do it. So again, I just implore us to make sure that when we present facts, if there's a caveat, we should say TCC believes they can have five more children. WCCC thinks if they receive $30,000 from Let's Grow Kids and $30,000 from the Woodstock and Economic Club, <coughs> and the fire person says they can do it, that they can add 20 kids in this age group in this way. Let's have a real conversation. So Adam started it and I'm glad. And I'm mad because if you just took ad verbatim what was said, I'm telling you, I'm in a unique position to know as a board member, as a citizen, and as a member of the WEDC and the chair of the child group, that those figures that were just stated were fundamentally incorrect and it's upsetting. I apologize. I'm very upset about this. We should open West. We should open WCCC. We should get things in all the union areas that we can. These families need help and we can't just spout facts and figures and that aren't based in 100% fact. That is what I'm saying, because we're all gonna go home and we're gonna be like, oh, it's taken care of in like two weeks or a month or soon. These families are gonna be fine. They're not fine without a lot of dominoes falling in the right direction. So that's that's what I'm talking about. That's where the emotion comes from. I, I respect everyone here. I don't respect the way the situation has been handled with the school. I don't respect the way the situation has been handled with families. And I'm very upset about it. So there you go. 
So if there are board members who are interested in being on a, a task force or a working group, uh, whatever we name it, please um, please make it known so that we can look at it from the board side um, instead of um, from just from Todd and his group and other groups. So I would be very interested to see who would like to work on this and do some outside of the box thinking and talk about um, ways of moving this forward. So you can let, let me, Sherry, uh, or Ben know we, are, we will be meeting again tomorrow morning as a, a group to put our heads together. All right, so we are now up to, I think, Shana. Director of Student Support Services. Uh, I'm also going to uh, keep my highlights very brief in the essence of um, this, this evening's agenda. Um, with the budget on everybody's mind, the special education department is trying to keep their thinking outside of the box. And instead of thinking about, oh, we're going to add staff or, oh, we're going to delete choices, really taking an inventory of the assets that we have in our educators, both in and out of the special education department, and thinking about distribution of those assets to be both physically and educationally uh, more responsible. There's a lot of talk about the rule changes that will be happening on July 1st of 2023. And Amanda Rank, who just returned from maternity leave, and I have been working on a comprehensive plan for educating the special education department and all the various areas that the rule changes will be taking place, working with Sue Hagerman, uh, many experts within the department and outside experts as well. And what's new with the rule changes is there will be an interplay between our multi-tiered systems of support, um, staff and procedures and the special ed department. And that's very new and that will take some time to work those kinks out and we've already started that work. Um, key leadership in the district, as well as folks in the special ed and MTSS teams have examined some valuable professional development opportunities and will be distributing themselves amongst those opportunities and then taking that learning back out into each of the buildings to share the wealth. And the last thing, um, something really great with the transition planning that was in the report, it's typically something that's done within the special education department only, but through the lens of the portrait of a graduate and wanting to extend opportunities to all of our students, the C3 staff reached out to us and has asked to participate in some transition planning to expand the work and community opportunities for all of the students in our district and elevate their expertise in those areas. So shout out to those educators at the high school and those. Any questions? Thank you, Shana. Next, we have our CIA director. I like to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Jen Stainton, Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. I have three updates for you today. Um, first, I want to let you know that our portrait of a graduate is in progress of continuing to come to life. We have created, or we are in the process of creating scoring criteria for each of the components of our portrait of a graduate. And this has taken some time because really thinking about how we assess our students in these areas um, requires thoughtfulness. Um, it also requires us to sort of think through what it might look like in the classroom. So the other thing we're developing are actions or look fors for what the portrait of a graduate might look like if any one of us walked into the classroom. So we're gonna have those documents ready and on the SU website, hopefully, oh, I'd say around February, that's the goal. So stay tuned for those. Um, I'd like to say to some families who have um, children participating in Title I services in our schools, um, you have received emails from principals invited to a meeting to dis discuss parent and family engagement policies and procedures that are school level. Um, so those are happening throughout the months of November and December. We had our first one at Prosper Valley last week, and we have some drafts ready for feedback from families, and um, those have been sent out, and we encourage you to attend those meetings, please, if you received an invitation. 
Um, we have just ended our fall assessment window, and um, we're going to be taking a look at some of that data tonight. So I'll hold off on speaking to that until later. And then I'll just say today was an in-service day that was amazing. We had teachers engaging in the letters training. We had high school and middle school teachers um, thinking about students and how to support them and engage them at school. And then we also had some excellent math conversations happening as well. So it was a good day. And thank you to everyone who participated. Is it for me? Jim, I think Jim has a question for you, Jen. Oh, oh sorry. Hey, Jim. Jim has, yeah. I know, yeah. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, so your first one where you were talking about the portrait of graduate and yes. the classrooms and the, 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 the children and everything, you said it's taken a while. Um, how long? There's a lot of people here that probably weren't even here in the beginning of portrait of graduate. Right. So like to get this system up and going, how long has it taken? I'll give them a little background. I mean, um, this is my first time in three months sitting here, and there's a few people here that I've never met before. And so, right. So, um, I want to say the year was 2016, maybe 2016. Um, so, you want like the history? You want me to just a little like, you know, the people here that they don't, and yeah, I mean, what is what's your graduate? Yep. What is the grade? And, like, we sit here, like, class talking about, and it's like, Great. what is it? So our, the portrait for graduate really came, came from a want in, in our district, and it's a want in many districts. So a lot of districts are moving in this direction to have sort of a vision for what it looks like when we graduate our students in the 21st century so that they're 21st century ready. They're ready for uh, engaging, um, whether it's in further education or in the workplace directly upon graduation. So we brought together a group of community members board members, students, teachers, community members, um, all together to think through what our priorities are for our students. Um, from that, we developed the five components that we have, and we sort of explicated components that might describe those a little bit. They are stewardship, skillful communication, critical thinking and problem solving, academic excellence, Okay. No direction, yes. Um, and uh, it's taken some time, first of all, for us to really just wrap our head on, heads around what it is and what it means for us. Um, we've actually sort of taken a grassroots method for implementing it as opposed to saying, this is what it looks like, let's now do it. We've allowed people to experiment and inform what it should look like. And so it's taken a little bit longer, but it's authentic. And it really um, meshes with what's happening in our classrooms. So um, we are now at the point where we can go back and say, all right, now let's capture what it could look like if we were to assess a student in self-direction or skillful communication. What would that look like in kindergarten versus junior year? Might look a little bit different. Or maybe there are a lot of similarities and we could have more global ways of assessing it. And then in addition, if I were to walk into a kindergarten classroom tomorrow, what are some of the things I might see if a student in kindergarten is self-directing or what might it look like if we have them engaging in stewardship. And we've done some presentations about our project of a graduate um, nationally. And I'd say the one feature or two features actually that really make ours important. Number one is stewardship. The community said that we really value stewardship in our students. What we mean by stewardship is stewardship of the self, stewardship of our community and the stewardship of our world. It's a, a global citizenship lens that has a care and empathy to it that um, really came through through our process. It's something that our teachers have really embraced. You'll hear a lot about it through our C3, um, our new craft program, and you see it even in our pre-K students when they're in the forest and classroom. And then I'd say another component that's really interesting is academic excellence. So academic excellence sort of captures all of the um, literacies that we really care about, whether it's ELA, science literacy, social studies literacy. All of those literacies and content areas are what feed into academic excellence. So it's a really nice capture of all the things we value in our students by the time they graduate. And so we're now at the point where we can try and make that really explicit pre-K through 12. Thank you. Sure. Well done. Any other questions? Any other questions? Fantastic summer. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> uh, now we'll hear from uh, Jim Fenn, the Director of Finance and Operations. Um, life's too busy. 
Um, we've been working on the budget, which uh, there will be presentation related this afternoon, this evening. Um, we've also been very fortunate to receive three significant grants recently. Uh, working with Jeff Martin at uh, Two Rivers out of Quichi and Emo Chenoweth from Butler Bus, we've received a grant for just shy of $1.2 million to buy three electric buses and a charging station. Uh, one of the things we're working on is picking back, backing a couple of uh, personal car charging stations onto the same service we're bringing in for the buses. Um, so that we can be a charging center here in our parking lot for for people with electric cars, hopefully employees or students, as well as people traveling through. Um, what was good is there was only two districts, two other districts in Vermont that received these grants, none in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, or Rhode Island, or Connecticut. There were nine in Maine. So somebody in Maine was really, you know, working on this. And this was national competition, and so we were really thrilled. We've also, we're working on air quality upgrades for Reading School, Reading Elementary School, for the Killington Elementary School, and the Woodstock Elementary School. We received um, an Efficiency Vermont grant for 200000 towards the Reading one, for $350,000 towards the Killington one, uh, we did not get a grant for Woodstock Elementary, but there's another program for air quality that I am in the process of preparing a grant application for to see if we can get Woodstock funded through that. If not, we still have money in our SO3 to pay for that so we can replace the old air handling equipment that's either failed or failing in these three buildings with new, new equipment. So that's where we are with these grants. Uh, other things going on. Um, next week, we're running our first payroll in our new software. Uh, in, in our new software. And so that's exciting. So we will get all the mistakes and figure it all out and cross it with a with a live payroll in our existing software and, um, and do some crosswalks, and it'll be good. So we'll be ready to go live January 1st. Uh, the auditors were here uh, all last week. Uh, the audit went well. They only were here about four days out of out of the five days that we expected them. Uh, they will be back for a little bit of single audit for the um, single, single audit requirements for the federal grants we get, uh, but the field work's done. So it went smooth, um, pretty quiet. We had, I would say one and a half auditors. Uh, one of the auditors was only here one day. So, yes, sir. Back on the uh, charging stations. Yeah. How many charging stations, cars? I don't know yet. Um, they're not part of the package, so I'm trying to figure out how to fit them into the package. Okay. We'll have three buses, which means we'll probably need two charging stations for buses. And my goal is to add two charging stations, so four plugs for cars. But that's my goal, and I've not done gone down the path yet to find funding for it or anything else. Okay, so <laughs> so the buses, um, I understand because it's replacing. From the oil, from the gas, and the whatever we're using. When you start putting in these charging stations and you're running a budget, and then you're hoping that staff and kids and people passing by, is it going to be a charge system where it's charging for it, or are you just going to give out free electricity that's going to be charged to the budget? And I, I just finding that from and um, a lot of people didn't think this through. The next thing you know, you got people that just park their car and they start charging and then they go for a nice little walk. And now you got a couple thousand dollars, whatever budget line for giving out free electricity and for their cars. And so at the moment, I don't have any answers for you because I've not gone far enough down the road yet to be able to answer them. But those are, you know, the money guy, I'm worried about those things. Yeah, I'm, just, um, I'm, just I'm also it. thinking about getting an electric car, you know. So I, 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 you know, I'd like to plug in every day here, not doing it home. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, but you know, uh, just so all of a sudden you have fifty electric charges. But no, I there and everybody's charging it up. I, I, I am concerned about taxpayers. I, I'm involved. concerned about that. I don't want the taxpayers to be giving out free electricity to everybody. So um, as I get more information, I will certainly share it with you. Okay, and there are there are like down at Rutland over behind Amtrak or Walmart. Where you actually put a card in yep. and it's charged to, so that that's 
And, yeah. and you can do something for staff as a discount or whatever. Right. Some of it's the strings strings attached to the funding. Yeah. If I get them for free, then do we have to provide free electric free charging for five years? Okay. And, or you know, and I don't know the answers yet. Um, yeah. I'm just asking you to look out for that. They, all these questions are on my list. Um, Bryce, did you have something to say? I was just going to ask why we were looking for car charging if it was to gain money or to give out of service. But that's he was just answering the fact that you're not sure yet, so that's okay. I'm it, satisfied. It, it, and for me, it's more to have a presence and make a statement. Yeah. And if I can do that without costing our budget, then um, then it's then it's good. If it's going to cost a budget, then we won't do. It. Um, Todd. I support the charging. I mean, of course, we have to make sure it's not going to cost, cost us the money. But um, I will say that what we're doing at Tassel Store, I've been learning a lot about this. And Green Mountain Power has a $750 per charger rebate, and they can help you with that. And if you want me to help you with any contact, I'm, I'm directly in charge of the head of the innovation department for Green Mountain Power. I talk probably once every two weeks. Um, and um, because we have the same questions at the Tassville store that that the board would have of who's paying for it, but we really want it. It sounds great. A level two charging gym, you can't go for a walk and charge your car much. So it's kind of one of those things that like they'd have to park there for eight hours to get much of a meaningful impact. Um, and that's what most of the chargers are out there. The DC fast chargers are the they require three phase power and they're really expensive. And that's what you probably need to charge the buses though. But um, yes. yeah, it's a cool, it's a cool thing. But if you want the Green Mountain Power Info, if that's helpful to you, I'm happy to email that to you, but you may already have it. If, if you would, I appreciate it because I don't have it yet. So thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lara? Is it, is this something that we could do that would actually generate income or is that like not allowed? I, I just wanted to know. It's, it's potentially something we could do to generate enough income to for maintenance or replacement. I don't know how much income we'd actually generate, but yes, it's it's something I'm looking at. And when I get more information, I will certainly bring it back to the board because uh, clearly I'm not the only one interested in it. So I'm happy to do that. that. They're gonna have to look out for. Yeah, so I appreciate everybody's input. Have you seen these buses? I have. Okay. I just was curious about like if something goes wrong with the bus, with like an electric bus, who fixes that? Like that's part of what has to be worked out. Okay. If it's a flat tire, the same guys that do it now. If it breaks, the same men and women that do it now. If it's the charging system, somebody from Kennebunk may have to come here, or somebody from Connecticut may have to come here, depending on where we buy the bus. Or a uh, butler bus may need to hire and train somebody who can work on the work. Like a specific bus that, you know, every, like all the states were getting the same bus or um, choose your own. There's essentially four manufacturers out there in the bus world that are doing electric buses. There's um, uh, Freightliner, Thomas Bus. There's uh, Navstar International, and I think they call theirs the Julie. There's the Lion bus, and then there's Bluebird. And they're the four manufacturers. Lion's the only, all they do is electric. The other three are the major manufacturers of school buses already. And um, believe me, since we've been awarded, they've all called. <laughs> <laughs> so we, they know who we are, and they want our business. No exhaust oil changes, though. <laughs> Mm. Well, kudos to uh, Jim for securing that the funding and being proactive on this. I think you know, Sam gives you a thumbs up too. Mm. So thank you for that. Any other questions for Jim? Jim? All right, and now we have the students. Mm -hmm. I saw both of you are here, Owen and Aiden. Yeah, um, I'm happy to start for the night. I'm, uh, I'll echo the previous reports and I'll try to be pretty brief. Um, Aiden and I just got off of a grueling academic day of uh, staying home while the teachers do in-service. Um, but I think to piggyback off of Ms. Sousa's point from uh, way back yonder, I think our, uh, our student leadership summit on social action went really well. I'm looking forward to developing that initiative more in the coming years. 
Um, I think overall, you know, from the student perspective, we've had our great late fall bonding exercises of homecoming and spirit week and the rest of that. So I think um, broadly student uh, student community building is at its peak right now. I would say um, from another perspective, Cody Tancredi and I have been working on developing some new initiatives around mental health and different programs that we can institute this year. So I think overall students are, are doing pretty well, but um, whatever Aiden has to say, you can go. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, thank you, Owen. I'm just gonna piggyback of what you said. Um, the summit um, was a huge success in my opinion. We definitely, um, we got Hartford students to come. We had like, like over 70 students. We had a lot of students attend. Um, it was a very successful day. I think we got a lot out of it. And I know on in Social Action Club, we've already synthesized, like we did at different activities where we'd kind of bring ideas together to create that student manifesto on um, student equity and leadership. And I know we're already starting to take those ideas and synthesize them and put them in a form where we can kind of put that more public. So um, it's definitely, that definitely went well. Um, just student activities recently, you know, we had homecoming, uh, and that went very well. I think a students, a lot of students really like that. Um, we, this weekend was very busy for sports. Uh, we had two teams, the Woodstock boys soccer and Woodstock girls field hockey go to the state championships, uh, girls field hockey won one zero against Hartford. And, um, I know on social media and everything that was, um, the huge, huge um because i don't think they had won since 2007 so it was very huge and um boys soccer lost 3-2 to people's academy but they fought hard um so yeah the sports fall sports have come to an end but it was has been great seasons for everyone and um yeah i mean besides that school's been going well for everybody and um i think this year has been off to a really good start Thank you, Aiden and Owen, and I'm, we'll be hearing from you a little bit later in the agenda to discuss the name changing of the district name. So thank you very much and kudos to the athletes for a great season from everything I read in the Vermont Standard. Um, all right, at this time, we're gonna invite Marilyn Mahusky to come uh, on Zoom and do some training around FERPA as a, result of a board, some board requests last week, uh, last meeting to understand better student records. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, sure can. Yes. Good. Um, so good evening. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm, as uh, the chair said, Marilyn Mahusky. I'm an attorney with Stitzel Page and Fletcher. Um, I think you're probably more familiar with my colleague, Dina Atwood. Um, she had a conflict, um, so asked me to step in. Um, Sherry and I talked briefly about this, and I understand that some of your concern or your primary concern about FERPA is access to student records. So I just want to sp speak briefly about what FERPA is, what the requirements are, what the prohibitions are, and then I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. So FERPA stands for the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. It is a federal law. It protects the privacy of student education records that are maintained by, in this instance, a school district. Um, every school district is required under federal law to have policies in place um, that prohibit the disclosure of personally identifiable information. And the statute and the regulations define what personally identifiable information is. And it includes name, um, uh, student's name, parent's name, address, any kind of personal identifier like a social security number or a student identifier. It also includes indirect information like a date of birth, um, place of birth, maiden's mo mother's maiden name. That was new. I didn't remember know that until I went and looked at it today. Um, and then this was something that was at that Congress added um, 
after the bill was originally passed in 1977. And that's that any other information that a long or in combination is linked or linkable to a specific student that would allow a reasonable person in the school community who does not have personal knowledge of the relevant circumstances to identify the student with reasonable certainty. And that's a really important piece when you think about the school board and what, if any, role the school board has in obtaining personally identifiable information or access to education records. Let me just tell you briefly that ed education records is defined very broadly, and it is any information that is directly related to the student or maintained by, the, in this instance, the LEA, the school district. FERPA covers all educational institutions that receive federal funds from any of the federal um, funding uh, statutes. So, but I'm only talking about school districts and LEAs because that's what's relevant to you. So we're not gonna talk about um, institutions of higher learning. So in order for a, a personally identifiable information to be released, with the exception of directory information, and you know at the beginning of the school year, the school sends out authorizations to students' parents asking them whether they want to be included in the directory. And that information is permitted to be disclosed if the person has authorized that. And, and students have the right to opt out or parents have the right on behalf of their students who are younger than age 18 to opt out of directory information. Um, but prior to any sort of publication or release of that information, um, the school district needs to have prior written notice um, and prior written, they need to give the parent prior written notice and they need to get written consent before that information can be disclosed. So even for example, if a court were to issue a subpoena or, um, or some other court order requiring the information, the school district would have an obligation to reach out to the parent first and foremost to obtain their written consent prior to the disclosure of that information. And that's um, <laughs> and the purpose behind that is so that the parent has an opportunity um, to object, right? So in a court process, they would have the right to file some sort of protective order or a motion to quash. Um, there are some exceptions to the, the overarching rule, which is that disclosure is prohibited. And that, um, there, you know, there's several of them listed in the statute, and I'm not going to go through all of them because most of them aren't relevant to this circumstance. But the exception that I think that you all need to be aware of, um, and this is that there is a broad exception um, that the LEA may disclose personally identifiable information from an education record without that prior consent, but the disclosure must be to school officials and the federal regulations define that as including teachers within the agency or institution. And this is really the key, is whom the agency has determined to have a legitimate educational interest. So even though the federal statute and the federal regulations don't define school official, the agency of or the Department of Education has defined school officials to include board members. However, where I think the prohibition comes in and why you're not entitled to have access to, for example, discipline records of a student or any other kind of information about the student is that um, in, you don't have an, um, a legitimate educational interest. Um, as defined by the statute to access that information. And the way the courts have de um, defined that is it's necessary to fulfill their professional responsibility. So even within a school district, not all teachers are entitled to all the information, right? If there's discipline, unless that teacher has a reason to know that information is maintained, the confidentiality of that information is maintained. And the same would be the case for, for any board member. The other reason for that is that in an instance where there might be a suspension or a expulsion that's brought before the board is that you need to maintain your independence so that you can um, uh, exercise due process in making a decision about whether or not to impose suspension or expulsion. So um, 
there are some other exceptions. The only other one that I would mention is the health or safety emergency exception. And again, this is something that's very narrowly defined. And it and it's a, an exception where um, it actually came out of sort of the uh, terrorist <clears throat> threat type exception, right? If there's an, an imminent threat to a student or other students, to a particular student or to other students, then there, there are certain circumstances whereby the school officials can make a determination to disclose um, information to appropriate officials. And that might be appropriate officials, for example, law enforcement. It might be um, if there's a, a group within the school that's dealing with threat assessments, um, they might be entitled to that kind of information, but again, it is very narrowly tailored um, to protect the confidentiality of students. So with that, I'm going to stop and ask if anybody has any questions. Todd has a question. Hi, thank you for that. I think one that was one component of what we wanted to talk about, but the I myself had a different aspect that I'd requested. So mm -hmm. I'm curious to get um, your expertise. What, what happens is that the disciplinary notices sent out by the school are have a level of broadness that's under this statute meant to protect anyone involved, which makes a lot of sense to me. But what I hear from my own interactions and some other parents as well in Woodstock um that they there's a it's a small rural community so let me make up a fake example that's based mm -hmm. a little bit on reality there was an incident on the bus everyone in town knows about it we don't know the person's name we do small town but the school sends out a notice the notice goes to everybody that had anything to do with that bus the high school the middle school sometimes there could be the pomfer bus this and that again rural america our place and they say hey something bad happened on the bus we're addressing it. And that means that parents are like, what happened on the bus? And then 50 parents will call 50 other parents in this rumor mill, mm -hmm. punch in the face. So what my question was is, are we doing, and maybe perhaps um, the chair or Sherry can send you examples later and discuss it with you in confidence. Are we, what are we able to say to parents to let them know? So if hypothetically someone punched someone in the face on the bus and everybody in the bus knows it, we're not going to say Johnny or Susie punch Fred in the face because we know we can't do that by what you just said. Mm -hmm. Parents want to know if it's safe the next day for their child to ride that bus based on what they may have or may not have heard, mm -hmm. which may or may not be based in fact. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping that we can learn from you the mm -hmm. best way to communicate when things happen without running afoul of the statute. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So if the discipline that you're referring to would cover a protected category, right? So for example, if the incident on the bus involved a racial slur, right? And the school would have an affirmative obligation under the anti-harassment statutes to investigate, then there might be an, an, an obligation because of the obligation to investigate and take affirmative steps to address and prevent that, there might be a reason for the school district to send that kind of notice out. But in terms of, I mean, I guess I would be really interested to know, like if, if another student hits another student, hit somebody on your example, a student punches another student. I guess I would want to know what's the reason for sharing that information, right? Because um, I think we can presume that if the school has been made aware of it, then they're going to have, they're going to take steps to address it. So if the student who was hit in the face uh, wants to know if disciplinary action was taken, then that parent can certainly approach the school and say, I want to make sure disciplinary action was taken. And again, the response would be very like, we're, you know, we've taken action to address that situation. And that's really about it that, that can or should be shared in that instance. So if there are other instances, I would be happy to hear, you know, have a conversation with Sherry about any specifics about that. I would just want to know, big deal. Somebody got hit in the fair and I grew up in Queens, but why do you have to go out and say that something was mean? I guess I thought it was a fight on a bus. Okay, so why does every single parent have to know that 
and maybe that's not the right thing or whatever. Maybe that's not going out. Yeah, I guess I'd be interested to know what's going out. And I'd also be interested to know if there are things going out, why it's going out, right? Sure. If it's yeah. important because we're addressing school climate issues, then maybe there's a reason to send that out if we can assure that it's that it's protecting the the um, uh, privacy of that individual and it doesn't contain any um, personally identifiable information. You know, the other exception around that is that information requested by a person who the LEA reasonably believes knows the identity of the student would also be prohibited. So we would want to be careful in the disclosure of information that there might be some kids on that bus who do know who that person is, right? But again, it's the school who has the obligation to maintain the confidentiality. It's not other kids on the bus. Ben? Yeah, Marilyn, if you could confirm this, my understanding is that, um, uh, that there's kind of a fundamental difference. And full disclosure, I'm a former prosecutor, right? So work in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And there's a fundamental difference between, you know, what people might see on TV on Law and Order, um, you know, with uh, the amount of coordination that happens with victims, right? Um, in, in the criminal justice system, there are victim advocates, people press charges, right, mm -hmm. uh, in that system. But that's not what, you know, when we're talking about student discipline, that's very different with FERPA, right? There's a higher interest in uh, student privacy. That's what the statute is there to protect. So I know, it's I know it's frustrating for parents whose children may have been hurt or who are scared mm -hmm. to go back to school that they can't get information or assurance that, um, you know, the, the situations are handled in a particular way, they can't have that information under FERPA, but that's the, the kind of balancing act that Congress did when they said that student privacy is more important than, you know, kind of the full disclosure of a criminal justice system. Is that accurate? That is absolutely yeah. accurate. It is. And when there are instances, I mean, when you look at some of the court cases where the issue has been challenged, you know, the courts do, in fact, talk about that balancing the interest. So, for example, in your instance, you know, if there were criminal records or criminal case involved, then there would still need to um, be a subpoena. It could be that court, you know, that the individual would have the opportunity to file a motion to quash or a protective order, the court might look at them in camera, which means that they're mm -hmm. they're done privately, and then the court decides what, if any, records would be relevant to the proceeding to disclose. And it is a very high bar that Congress, you know, in 1977, or actually probably earlier than that, it didn't go back and actually look at the exact um, the onset date of the law, but, you know, uh, for many decades has now uh, made very clear the high value it places on protecting student confidentiality and privacy. Um, so thank you, Ben. I just was wondering, so I, if I had a parent come to me and say, you know, such and such child has assaulted such and such number of other children over the last such and such number of months. And what is the school doing now to protect my child? And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, what? How do you respond to that? Like you just did. So <laughs> I mean, yeah. I know. Like, why don't you know you're on the school board? You should know about this. And you know, it's just it was very well, Sherry may have a have a response, but I'll tell you from my former school board days, what I remember being told is that, you know, when parents, community members approach you in the grocery store, wherever, and ask, hey, what's going on, you, you know. It, it's not your place to address that, right? It's like we, it's your job to maintain the privacy and confidentiality of all students. If someone comes forward and complains to you about something that happened, you know, uh -huh. your job is to send it back through the chain of command at the school, right? And let them address it. And if it's something that needs to rise to the level of board awareness, then that's why you have the CEO, mm -hmm. you know, that's why you have a superintendent. All right, Todd. Um, I think that's really interesting. So maybe we should think about as a board, and I'm curious just to hear other people's opinions on this. Hey, maybe Joan, something... Joan, your camera's on, hon. You want to turn that off? Yeah. Maybe we'll focus on we'll focus on chalk. <laughs> maybe maybe we shouldn't maybe we shouldn't send out the letter that's so generic that it causes 
the the small town folk to do the rumor mill because some of this stuff i don't know one way or the other but it creates such fervor because there's sometimes not a lot to talk about around here maybe there is maybe there isn't but something happened on the bus again maybe maybe there's a time and place to do that and maybe we're erring too much on doing that i mean i'm curious what what other people think but based on what you're saying and what ben said and what jim said i could get behind that like less is more almost mm -hmm. so is that maybe that's just a balancing act that we should think about right well, I'd be, you know, I'd be, I mean, obviously we'd be more than happy to take a look at the notices that go out and just, you know, if, if Sherry felt there was something that was appropriate for, for us to take a look at, or the board thought so, certainly we could take a look at what those notices are and weigh in on whether or not, you know, we think that they're a concern or not. Certainly it's an important issue for sure. We do live in a small towns. So we live in a small, small state with small towns. <laughs> Right, and I think that the principals have, you know, the, it's the balance piece that to inform families that we are aware of the situation, that it's under consideration because I've seen it within moments, a, a small incident becomes a major event mm -hmm. and parents want to know that the school is informed of that event. And it also gives us an opportunity if we're not having conversations with parents on the things that we're addressing, we want parents to call us. If there are things that are happening that are in the community, and we are not under, under you know, your children coming home to you, they're disclosing to you what their experience have been. Mm -hmm. And so that sharing of information is really critical back and forth. So it's a balance. I think my principals mm -hmm. do a really nice job. They're very experienced. Um, what people do with that information and go from there, we don't have control of. But our goal is to reaffirm with parents that we are addressing the situation and the safety is the most important piece to that. Um, I'm just going to speak to Joan. I think you want to probably turn your camera off. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, Jim? Um, sitting on the board for 12 or whatever years, with Sherry and I, whatever, back and forth over a bunch of things in the previous. I mean, when it comes to you as a board member, you have to remember that you're out of it until it gets to an executive session and then you're in it. You're supposed to, just because you're a board member doesn't mean you have privilege to information that other parents aren't gonna have. So when someone comes to me and says, do you know anything about the way this program is supposed to work is, I'm really not supposed to know anything until mm -hmm. it gets to, the executive session because then we become the jury, I guess, in That's right. between the parents and the school. So your best way of mm -hmm. handling it is, is like, I mean, like I had said, I don't know where I grew up, they'd probably be sending out letters every hour that there was a fight on the bus or whatever, but they didn't do it. It's just, you know, you, you know, there was a fight. Everybody knows there was a fight on the bus if there was, but the other stuff, it's just, you got to wait and you can't be pushing the superintendent or the staff mm -hmm. to know what's going on. You have, you're going to, if it gets to as far as then bringing it to court and whatever, you need to have no idea of what's going on. Mm -hmm. That's it. So just, I don't know. Go to the superintendent. Leave and people me, do. You know, leave, me, leave me alone. Or I remember seeing how many parents in there, and it's a great mm -hmm. way. And there, and there are many other times that maybe I've seen something. And I've gone to the superintendent and say, leave me out of it. This is what I see. This is what's going on. That's your job. It's mm -hmm. not my job. But I see something. Mm -hmm. It's not right. It's not my job to take care of it. It's mm -hmm. the school system. Bryce? I, I just want to piggyback on what Jim is saying because <clears throat> from previous uh, incidents we've had. I know sometimes Sherry has come to the board and, and shared something at that point, right? In executive session, and there's been some frustration why we didn't get even more detail even in that executive session. So to go off what Jim was saying, there's some cases where um, this might be a case that either ends up being a court case against the district or going um, not unhappy with the school decision going to AOE. And it's if it comes back from there is when the board would potentially be like the jury. So even in the, some cases when the superintendent brings it to us in the executive session, it still does not mean that the board is going to get all the information. You might 
hope to be seeking. Mm -hmm. It's more her giving, giving us a level of awareness at that point in time, knowing that this is on the, you know, potentially on the horizon and it may come back. And at that point in time, the board would you know, get more information, but I know mm -hmm. it can be frustrating sometimes. And I just mm -hmm. wanted to add on to your comment on that. Yeah. Uh, Todd. Yeah, I just want to say this has been incredibly helpful for me. And I think that maybe we should think about like a mandatory mini session for new board members because everything makes such great sense. I just feel so much better about not having answers personally. And <laughs> it's like, there's nothing better than being like, I can't talk, this. talk to Sherry. Like that, that, that's yeah. the best version. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but no, seriously, thank you so much. For You're me, welcome. it's incredibly helpful. I hope for others as well. Good, good. Well, just before I before I say goodbye, let me just I want to kind of go back, circle back for a second to follow up on what Sherry said of, you know, that there could be reasons why the district would want to send notices out. Right. And again, if it's not doesn't contain any personally identifiable information. The other thing then then it's, you know, it may well be OK. The other thing is, is that if it's not if, if it's public knowledge, like every kid on that bus who saw it, they have public knowledge of that, right? They have per firsthand knowledge. So they're allowed to talk about that just so, that, you know, just so that's really clear. And if there happens to be a teacher on the bus and has knowledge about that, you know, there could be circumstances under which that would be permissible as well. So anyway, with that, if there's no more questions, thank you. Yeah, I know you have a lot on your plate tonight and uh, thank you very much. Thank you thank very you much, much Marilyn. Thanks, bye. Share my screen. All right, next up we have the fall data presentation. Um, Raph, Patty, and Jen. I'm going to invite Shana to come to the panel with us because she can also discuss things a little bit and help answer some questions. <laughs> Sherry, I shared with you a slide deck as well. Oh, this in addition to that? Okay, so I'm going to have to unplug it. Is there? Okay, I can just speak without the slide deck. You sure? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, and now I have that. Okay. Unless you want to zoom in and be a co host. Um, yeah, speaking for you. Like, speak. That's okay. I think that's good. Nope. This is, is this? Okay. Yeah, we're good. Here, we go. All right. So, um, we do this presentation annually about our um, data, academic data from the fall, in terms of what we have collected thus far. Um, the goals for this presentation are to first raise some awareness about some new state level data changes that are coming down the pike. Um, tell you a little bit about our universal assessment system. Patty Kelly is going to share data walls and how data walls are influencing how we serve our students. Um, we're going to have some time to explore district wide data, which you see up there on the screen right now. And then we'll share some reflections from teachers and administrators across the district around the data. First point um, is a little bit cloudy for all of us at this point, but the SBAC will not be happening this year. They are shifting away from the SBAC test to Cognia, I believe is how it's pronounced. Um, it was uh, released maybe just a couple of weeks ago, this information. And frankly, um, no one really knows much more than that at this point. Um, so a lot of the data you're going to see tonight has been um, sort of binned or understood in our district because, it, because we compare it to SBAC data in a sense. Um, so when we have this new test come in and we have new information come in about our students, we're going to have to rethink how we um, sort of determine proficiency in our students. Everything at this point has been matched against the SBAC. Um, so spring 2023, Cognia will be the new state level assessment. Um, in terms of universal assessment, um, we had our fall testing window. We had STAR testing happening in reading and math for grades two to the 10. We had DIBBLES happening in grades K to three. And then we had Forefront, uh, which is a math universal screener happen in grades uh, K to two. Now, what we're doing is essentially really refining our internal assessments, 
right? These yearly state level assessments give us only so much data. We need more information to understand how our students are doing, specifically in reading and math. So between STAR, Dibbles, and Forefront, we're getting a better picture of what our students need and allow us to take actions to move forward. Now, what's really important is that all of this data needs to be, be easily accessible to principals. And so Patty Kelly is going to speak really quickly to um, data walls that she has created for principals, just so you get a sense for that. Patty, are you there? I am. Hi, everyone. Um, so data walls traditionally in schools were often done like right on paper and little post-its for student names and data information, information that um, often administrators or teachers would work together in, in creating student groups and support groups for students. Um, but we've moved that to an online platform for lots of reasons, primarily to make it um, more efficient to look at data and think about data, um, sorting it differently and being more efficient with working through data protocols that schools are doing. Um, we um, have set up these systems where we have multiple assessments going on, um, but it's really important that we're looking at students' data in terms of the whole picture or as much of a picture of their achievement as we can get in one place. So these data walls are intended to bring the pieces of data together for students and be able to see over time and over the various assessments that they're doing that we can see some patterns or see some needs for additional support for individual students or groups of students. Um, so I've been putting these data walls together for schools so that principals can then work with teachers and follow protocols to work through looking at this data a little more comprehensively about um, the, the bigger picture that we're trying to learn about students and their various needs. Um, so they were using these data walls um, when we completed our spring or our fall assessment window um, to be able to come back and, and work with teachers around what students need. Um, and in addition to collating information across the various assessments, I'm also building this from historical data. So from last year's data, I pulled that through to our spreadsheet so that we can see um, for a given student how they've performed over time as well and seeing that over multiple years. I have a question. What is a data wall? Um, so, and I apologize because we had a screenshot on this on the uh, presentation as well. So, um, essentially, it's just a spreadsheet, um, and they are um, organized by grade level and have the various assessments and the scores. And then I've color coded them for various achievement levels, so we can. Uh, work and group students with different areas of need or making sure that we're providing support for students as needed. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and in the past it was a wall in the school with sticky notes and you could like put and students you, together. Data wall, data wall, data wall, I'm like, what's data wall? So um, if you think about it, we've got these assessments teachers are giving and teachers can see how students are doing on an individual level in their classroom. Patty's put together these data walls so that a principal can look at the data and help teachers make strategic student groupings to help support students. What we've never had is a way we can bring all of that to the district level and have an understanding of how we're doing as a district, right? Our own internal mechanism for seeing that. So what we have tonight is uh, the product of many years worth of work and thought on RAF's part. Um, and uh, we have a district data dashboard. Um, so I'll let Raf speak to that a little bit. Thanks, Jen. So, um, so what you see up on the screen, this is the first attempt at a, at a public data dashboard for us. Um, and, and this is, now that we had a conversation about FERPA, you'll sort of see the challenge here. What we want to do is, is we want to be able to um, highlight some of the challenges, share with you, share with our community some of the challenges that we, we know that we face um, in, in educating our students while also protecting student privacy and FERPA. 
Um, so just to orient you a little bit, um, so up on the screen there, so you'll see two drop downs. Those are filters that can be changed. So you can break those down um, according to uh, male and female students, and then also by food reduced lunch status. Um, so if you click on those boxes, the rest of the graphs will change, and you'll be able to drill down and be able to see more information about um, one particular group. Um, in the center of the screen, you'll see the percent of students who are proficient. Um, that's the cut point that we've set, as Jen said, that's aligned to SBAC that was based on data that we had years ago and that we've carried forward. That's the, the level that we set for that. Um, to the right of that is a metric that um, this particular assessment has um, that measures growth. And so this, um, for students who've had more than one assessment, it will show us whether they're making adequate progress. And so we can see within a group of students whether they're making progress compared to a national cohort, so students from across the country. Sorry. It's just... I had to <laughs> Um, in the lower left, you'll see a breakdown of the proficiency levels of that particular whatever filters you have, and then on the right are the breakdowns by grade. Um, and so we really wanted to give this, um, to, to find a way to have these conversations because what we know and what is the trend across the state and across the country is that students who are receiving free reduced lunch do not perform as well on standardized academic assessments as students who do not. And in some cases, these gaps are very large. Um, so we want to start having conversations about this and begin to think about ways that we can um, build systems um, and, and serve those students better. Um, so on the left, the top is our star math. So that's a third through 10th grade. Um, the next one is star reading, similar breakdown, um, similar components just with the reading assessment instead of math. Um, the next one down is um, uh, some graphs over time. So this is showing the percent proficient um, and um, the percent making adequate growth over the time that we have administered um, the STAR assessment. Uh, so you'll be able to see, you can see where COVID happened and, and, and the impacts of that over time. The last two are the newest um, that, that we added, and, and there's a little bit different information here, but this is a kindergarten through two assessment um, of, of reading the, the, the Dibbles. Um, and so you'll see that there's no growth measure, but there is um, a, a percent proficient. And again, we, we have those filters. And what we see is that our, our gap um, between students receiving free use lunch and those not receiving free use lunch um, starts in kindergarten. Um, What's the devil? It's the name of the assessment. Okay. Um, it's the name of the test. Um, so, so you can begin to see how how those numbers change based on based on different groups. Um, the last one down is the is, is the core one, which is um, a math assessment in kindergarten through second grade. Um, which which is focused, I believe, on numeracy and and and. and that specific math skill. Um, so we hope this will be an opportunity to, to, to begin to look at some data to, to make it publicly available that we can have some, some meaningful conversations. Um, all these assessments are limited. They're all, it's, it's important not to put too much stake in any single one of them. It's really important to understand multiple assessments and see how a student's doing. Um, but we can start to get a picture of, of our district's academic performance by looking at these. And this will be available on the SU website for anyone to... Yeah, it's not available yet, but, but it will be after the yeah. I saw that Ray Rice has his hand raised. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, I guess I understand the drop-down menus and maybe gender, but what's the lunch eligibility drop-down menu? Why do you separate that? Yeah, that's a good question. So this has been an area, I mean, just sort of in, in the history of education, this has been one of the larger areas where there's a gap between students. Um, and so when we've had our annual report card from the Agency of Education, one of the areas that they've identified um, in our district of us not having equitable outcomes is around this free reduced lunch status. Um, so that's 
and, and it, like I said, it's a statewide trend. It's a national trend. It's 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 a very very, it's a significant difference. And it's a it's a proxy for socioeconomic yeah. status. Right. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. It helps us identify those that are economically good. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I don't know. If you're getting <laughs> Does that make sense, Greg? Yeah. It's it's the only way, the only tool that we have to address or identify students as having an economic disadvantage. Um, so just to wrap this up a little bit, um, we did present this to our teachers in the district and we received from, some feedback from them. Um, they were very thankful to be able to see all of the data in one place and see trends among grade levels and to be able to see disparities in our data. A couple of things they noticed that I just wanted to bring up, um, they are really valuing, and you can probably speak to this a little bit as well, Shana, really valuing the Dibbles and Forefront data. Um, we didn't have a good assessment system at the lower grades because um, STAR was only going down to the second or third grade level. It's actually really actionable data. So teachers are able to decide what next steps to take or know who they need to do a little bit more assessing on in order to understand how to best serve them. So they're finding that those assessments have been very helpful in their classrooms. Yes. Sorry to cover this, but what, how do you explain the discrepancy between Dibbles and Forefront? I mean, if you look at Forefront, you'd think, gosh, we're, if you went to like slide five there, yeah. the, our district's amazing for these K through two. And if you went to Dibbles, you'd say, oh my gosh, we need to do something. So the difference there is that um, Forefront assesses mathematics, okay. in particular number sets. So only one particular portion of mathematics understanding, right? Um, Dibbles is assessing reading, oh. um, phonemic awareness, phon phonological awareness, um, which is all about early reading needs. Um, so very different things that are being tested there. Thank you. This is great. Are there any other questions? Uh, yeah. Jim? 60th percentile. What, is it? what grade level? Um, it's not a grade level. So it's a it's the percentile of that. So so it's overall based on that grade level, whatever the 60th percentile is. So it's 60 percent of the 60th percentile or higher, 51 percent were proficient. And this, this gets back to the 2016 question that threw this whole district into this big long thing on something we're going to talk about later, but what is proficient? And back then I was told it was a seven. So I'm going to leave it at that. I don't know if that's true or what, but back then I was told by the school district that proficient was a 70. Because I had my ass handed to me because I said it's no big deal. We'll just pay the teachers 70% of their salary if they're only going to teach the 70. 60% of based on the star criteria, Greg. It's 60%. That's their work. That's their work. Yeah, so this means so this means that a student um so <laughs> The reason the 60th, so we could choose any number for this. And, and we chose the 60th percentile because that was the best that we could find at the time, um, correlation with how students would do on the SVAC. We wanted to know whether a student was going to be deemed proficient on the SVAC. And the 60th percentile um, on, on the STAR was a good indication of that. So it, there is a difference between percentile and percent. So this is, so if you're 60th, percentile, it means that you have scored higher than 60% of the other people who have taken the test. Right, but, but you stated more proficient. Yeah. And you were able to a grading system that is based on proficient. So once again, I'm sitting here asking what we're saying, we're going to go to a one through four or an ABCD, but one through four of the, the level definitions here is telling me that a four is out above really the benchmark, which is a great level because it's proficient. And a three is on watch. But if you take the GPA, one, two, three, four, and this is where parents came in, a three is a B, and I don't know a B or a B plus, how many parents would be happy with their kids having a B or a B plus, so why are they on a watch? And this is what really took us into these conversations back in 2016 
to work on a grading system that's in place that could use some um, could use some changes, but not in a rush. But that's I'll leave it at that. But my understanding is the four three two one and grading this here in our school system is quite different from a national test. Right. Well, so this is um, nationally normed testing. Um, when you're talking about classroom grades, it's criterion referenced um, and by standards. So it is a nice jumping point, however, for conversations about grades. What do we value? Like where, where do we want proficiency to be? That's a really important conversation. He's dropping it. I'm just saying what happened back then. That's all. I lived it. You guys lived it. Bryce. I just want to say as someone who's not a fan of standardized testing, but is a big data person, but I think this is great. And it gives us, especially the board level of parents, just kind of a good macro view and, and some, some thoughts, being able to combine multiple um, you know, mechanisms together into one slide. Right? So I appreciate it. And I also, it, it really helps us to fine tune to make sure the practices, especially as we shift practices, to make sure we're having an impact. Because I think for many years, we were trying different things and looking at different strategies to improve proficiency. But this really gives us data across the district. Now that everyone is receiving the same professional development, we have similar curriculum, we have very standardized practices, we now have a way of showing growth. Proficiency is such a wide and loaded term, but I think what it does provide us with, and it gives us a communication tool with our communities, our board, about we're trying letters. We have a baseline. We need to show to you as a board of community that that is having an impact that we had hoped or hypothesized to have. So it allows us to have a tool to have those conversations and allows you all as a board of community to hold us accountable. We're doing math impact. We're doing letters training. We're doing some different things in terms of how we address student behavior. This allows you to hold us accountable to make sure that we are showing growth that's why we really, we as a, you know, as leaders and teachers, look at are our students growing? Do they come in with a set of skills and as they move through our district, those skills increase and are enhanced? That's our job. And so this is one way of communicating with our communities, as well as amongst ourselves having conversations about individual student needs, and then what is the impact of the changes and the resources that you provide us with as a board. We have to demonstrate that we're using that money wisely and for good student outcomes. And so there are many ways we can use it, but it's it's a very big level, higher level than a granular level. So this is great work. Are there any other questions from the Zoom audience? Because I can't see you. Oh, looks good. All right, well, thank you very much. Hold on. Stop sharing. All right, we now have a presentation from the C3 group. All right, so now I've got to make sure. I think we need a little Zoom back here. I can provide that. Let's the time is it's past the bedtime already. <laughs> what? Well, okay. Yeah, but how do I? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're covering up. We have there. to limit the number of presentations we have. There we go. And that, see, we just have to talk it through. Can okay. you, um, yeah, I'm going to put it in the show. Show me. Okay. Hang on, I'm just going to run by that. And this. Great. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, it's really wonderful to be here. Thank you for making space in your agenda for us. And thank you to Sherry and Jen for the invitation. Um, my name is Luis Bango. I'm a teacher in the middle school and high school. And um, I'm here with my amazing colleague, Beth Hazlett. And we're here to tell you the story of, of what the C3 is all about. It, the C3 stands for the Center of Community Connections. 
And essentially it's a, a newish department program in the middle school and high school that allows students to, um, to personalize their learning, to bring their interests into the building. It's, it's kind of a, partly in response to Vermont's uh, Act 77, which is the Flexible Pathways Act that emerged in uh, 2013. And we launched this program in 2018, in the fall of 2018. And uh, I think we had some wonderful success. The goal was to create this space, this clearinghouse, this hub in the school where students could, as you, as you can see from the slide, um, personalize their learning through online learning, through independent studies, uh, through offering, create, create their own offering and design their own offering that wasn't uh, available in our school, career exploration, internships, work-based learning, community-based learning. So our goal was to really make our school walls more permeable and create opportunities for our, our students, both on our campus, but also off of our campus outside in, the, in our community. I would say that the, um, the work that we do is really uh, based on three ideas that are foundational. One is that when you allow for students to come and bring their interests and to personalize their work, there's greater engagement and better outcomes in the, in the work. Um, we both are strong believers in uh, career exploration and something that is termed sometimes as, as career connected learning. And we feel that the more opportunities we provide our students to explore careers and opportunities uh, with mentors and with professionals and in different areas, um, that will lead to better informed students, better prepared students, more readiness for four year post secondary experience or an apprenticeship or the workplace. And then finally, Beth and I both really strongly believe that we live in a special place with wonderful resources, many, many assets, not just Woodstock Village and town, but all the surrounding towns, the upper valley. So we work hard to build stronger ties and relationships with other entities, organizations, nonprofits, businesses um, to build stronger ties so that we can create these opportunities for our kids, both on our campus and, and off of our campus. And with that intro, uh, we do have another slide. That you, you can, thank you, Sherry, you can go to number two. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we feel that the work that we do checks a lot of these boxes. I mentioned previously this Act 77, which is uh, a statewide initiative and, and many high schools and middle schools have uh, entities within their school that fall under this umbrella of flexible pathways. Um, our strategic plan and our portrait of a graduate that, that Jen referred to earlier are two kind of guiding documents for us as well. I'm, I'm really proud. I think that the work that was done back in 2017, 2018, 2019 to create the strategic plan was collaborative and resulted in a, a really wonderful blueprint, um, as well as the portrait of the graduate, which um, Beth will speak a little bit more about because that's uh, the, the types of experiences that, that our students uh, ex participate in with us uh, are mostly for elective credit, which gives us the flexibility to use the portrait of a graduate in a really flexible way for assessment. So um, I'll, I'll hand it off to Beth. Okay. <laughs> um, one thing that Luis didn't say is that we could probably talk about this for hours, but <laughs> recognizing that this crew is already at 8.20, we won't. <laughs> we were told to uh, sort of peg this for about six minutes. So um, we're gonna move right along. If you go to the next slide, sure, I think. Um, but I do wanna invite people who have questions to, if, if there's time afterwards to ask those, but also to, um, we would also really appreciate um, more engagement with the board and board members and community members about this programming. 
So before the COVID sh shutdown, you can't really see that on the title there, but um, we had we launched it in 2018. It actually this work came out of a grant, uh, a fellowship that um, Luis had through the Roland Foundation. Um, and so he was Narissa Edwards, who was a, a counselor at our school at that time. Um, we did some heavy lifting and engaged with um, our school community um, as well as our more general community. And we designed this, that really this came out of their, their work. Um, so um, we had, our concept was to have three levels of programming um, that were designated for certain grade levels um, because we wanted to have a continuum of experiences um, within the middle school and high school that would support our students um, in th thinking about their passions, the things that they were truly interested in, their futures, career, educational opportunities, et cetera. Um, and like we said, we do have just, you know, a real wealth of resources. Um, you know, we've mentioned like community partners, but we also have some um, kind of uh, large employers in our area that also have workforce um, development programs. And so some of that is what we've also tried to tap into. Um, so this is what we looked like before COVID. Um, we got launched. Um, we had a, a um, level one, which was designed for the eighth grade. Um, and that was building on, a, I think, probably six or seven year program that we had been doing on the eighth grade that was the Career Futures Project, a year long exploration of, um, that was really a career exploration. Um, <laughs> And um, and for the second level, we um, we have we wanted to bring back something that had been done previously in the high school and the junior level, but we decided that we wanted to place it on the sophomore level because it seemed like it would kind of open some doorways for that junior and senior level experience in our school. And so we did the sophomore shadow day. Um, and so all and the first level um, on the eighth grade and the second level on the tenth grade level were really designed as universal access, all students having access to this programming. Um, we, our hope was that by having those two universal access points to the programming, um, we would, by the time students were in the 11th or 12th grade, they would then, if they wanted to, opt into um, further C3 programming that would involve designing an internship, doing a service learning project, designing an independent study, um, and engaging in work-based learning. So that was kind of our concept. Um, if you could advance to the next slide. Then COVID. <laughs> and uh, COVID really did uh, kind of wreck what we had going <laughs> in many, many ways. Um, in addition to our school doors being closed, us being sent home, um, I was shifted into um, the English department, um, so left um, the C3 team for two years, um, and no community partners wanted to see our students. Um, so it was really kind of difficult time. So this year is the first year that we're really in the rebuilding phase. Um, at this point, we don't have the, um, the full extent of the Careers Futures Project on the eighth grade team. Um, Luis and I are in conversation with um, the counselors who serve the middle school students, as well as eighth grade team members, to see what we can build back, how we will build it back. So we are talking about that, and we our hope is that we will have some programming for the eighth grade um, level students this year and then into the future. Um, on the um, level two, the sophomore shadow day, we are um, in conversation with community partners. We had some really great um, hub sites that sponsored multiple students. So we're already talking to them about dates and we're already talking to our 10th grade English teachers about the programming that uh, the, uh, that will include. And so that is gonna be in March of 2023. And then on the 11th and 12th grade level, um, we this year we have, uh, or this semester we have 30 um, students, which is, we're, you know, that, that was good. We grew from six at the beginning of, uh, at the kind of midsummer to 30. Um, so that's very good. Um, but we're, our, our peak was about at 40 pre COVID. So we're not quite back where we were. Um, and, um, but it does seem like 
community partners are willing to engage and um, we're pretty excited about what's going on there. Can we get to the next slide? Okay. Um, so if you walked into our building and came to our the C3 classroom, uh, before you got there, you'd see a big bulletin board with um, what we call project bios. And what we ask our students to do is they're developing their independent study or service learning project is to create a project bio. So the, the text comes from those project bios and pictures do as well. Um, so we just wanted to introduce you to four projects and students um, and kind of what they're doing. Um, so this, uh, this student is um, actually uh, very engaged with the idea of Braille literacy and American Sign Language and sort of how it gets implemented um, and kind of some of the um, sort of a crisis in those two language systems. And so she's actually one of her community connections <laughs> is Superintendent Sousa. <laughs> And um, and so she's doing a, a series of interviews. She's doing research. She has just like full on dived into this project. Um, we don't know exactly what her final product will be um, because she also has a, has a creative bent. And so, you know, this is just like, she's really passionate about this. Um, and then do you want to advance to the next one? So this is Violet. She's also a senior. Uh, her project is um, an internship. And but she's called it Money Rack, exploring the world of retail management. So uh, Violet, Violet works down uh, in the village uh, with uh, Kim Smith as her community mentor. And she's worked in different jobs throughout her high school year, but she really wanted to do a deeper dive into what it's like to run a small business, uh, inventory, rent, um, marketing, bookkeeping, all those things. So, um, so her plan is to continue study after she graduates from Woodstock and go to a four-year college and uh, major in something like business or marketing. I have to say, I've seen her grow through that and it's amazing. She's fantastic. Just a <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, this is Emily. Um, Emily is also a senior and um, she's intending to um, go to um, a New England School of Hair Design after she graduates. And um, she came to us um, wanting to explore that field more and, and really needing to do that to find out whether that was the right field for her. And um, so she is, um, she her community partner is Brenda Blakeman at um, First Impressions. And um, and anyway, it's, it's been a really um, wonderful to see um, this young woman like to like really look at her future and think about it. So a great example. Yeah, just to, to one final comment about Emily is that there's a wonderful program for cosmetology through Hartford. And a lot of our kids really benefit from that program, but it's a two-year program. It requires students to make kind of a sacrifice with regards to some of the programming that they can participate uh, here with us on our campus. So this was an alternative, uh, not the same experience as, as Hartford, but an alternative experience that allowed Emily to, to experience. Um, you know, cosmetology this way. So, this is one we're really excited about. Um, this is Owen. He's also a senior. And you may have seen his hats around town because he started a business with two of his classmates about a year ago called Gooba Hats. And um, he came to us and he says, I, I want to dedicate and protect some school time to learn more about how I can grow this business and expand. So, um, he spends time with us. We were, we we bring him. We have made some connections with uh, other business people in town, including um, Andrea Gregory from Woodstock Creative Customs, and we had a wonderful meeting with her last week. And she gave him a lot of positive feedback and encouragement, and uh, made some wonderful suggestions on how he could improve his, the stitching that his hats currently have so, so that they can be more like stronger and more flexible. So um, this is one that is fun because we see, we're starting to see a lot of these hats pop up around school. Um, this final slide was, you wanna take this one? 
Well, um, so this was this was an advertisement that was placed after our first job shadow. So we actually only were able to do one job shadow. Our second one got canceled, and, and so. Um, but we had over 60 community partners, um, individuals, businesses, um, organizations that um, agreed to host our students. And many of them were quite close, you know, within say 10 miles or 15 miles. Some of them were a little farther in the field like, as far as Burlington and Montpelier. Um, but we just thought it was like really interesting to have a kind of a, a sense of like the kind of connections that can happen out of that kind of event. Because I think some people say, oh, it's just one day. But I, I think it's more than that. Um, and I think it shows that there are a lot of people out there um, in the community who want to um, support our students and believe in our students, which is something I tell students all the time. Like you are at an age where if you want to find out about something, there are adults who are willing and happy to help you with that, um, who really like want you to have a successful future. So um, I think that that sort of shows this. Um, and um, so we think it's a, a really valuable thing for our school, but also those community members, because I think it does give something to community members to know that they've helped a young person on their way. Just that, yeah, this this represents what well, I think is important for us to to put these ads out and thank the people that stepped up and, and took on the student for that day. The sophomore shadow is a heavy lift for a single day, but it really pays dividends because these are the these are the it's kind of a low risk way for a community partner to get involved with us for a single day with one or two students. But it's a way for us to cultivate this relate these relationships that are so important and that can turn into kind of a deeper relationship for an 11th or 12th grader later on. So it's well worth it. Quick personal note. My youngest did his junior job sale at a PMO. Uh, resulted in him in applying and he's now the assistant manager at Darkside and in, in Redlo. And it really was, and he will say, because of his job shadow at a PMO, Understanding that that is the community that we wanted to be in. So, yeah. so I'm happy to employ. Are there any questions? If you're on Zoom, just speak out. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Right. At this point, we have um, updates on the committees and working groups. Finance committee update. Oh boy, are we ready to this? I mean, we've been going for two hours here. Do we need a bio break? Yeah. Take the bio break. Maybe five and a half break. Yes, we need a five minute break. Snacks. Yeah, right. Snacks. Member of the days in middle school, high school, we have snacks, uh, <laughs> school board meetings, we have apple juice. Oh, thanks for the no Yeah. 
you want let the let the hear the lawyer talk after uh, after two hours of board meetings so uh the purpose of, of uh this presentation is we're really kicking off the, the the budget process uh jim hey jim do you want to come up we're going to have you speak quite a bit too um so i've got about a, a dozen slides here most will go pretty quickly but the, this is really twofold 
One is to kind of give new board members a, a background on how we put together the budget each year, right? And how the how the finance um, process works in Vermont for school budgets. And then it's to give you uh, an update and uh, uh, kind of a, a little bit of a deep dive on where we are with the budget for FY24. And we'll have a first look at tax rates uh, as an early look. So without further ado, here's uh, what we're going to cover uh, over the next several slides. Uh, we're going to go over the, the budget process timeline from here. Those uh, school finance basics. Going to look at some uh, some of the budget documents that uh, uh, Jim has prepared. We'll look at the key factors that we kind of keep an eye on as we go through the budget process and give a, a status of, of where we are with each of those. And then look at the trends for our budget over the last few years and where we look like we're heading. And uh, the last thing is uh, in uh, November, we, we need to set the tuition rates for, um, for, the, uh, for the, the following school year. And the reason for that is that we need to give uh, towns around who may be interested in sending their kids here advance notice of what what our tuition is. Okay, so uh, here's the here's the timeline, and uh, these slides will be available. I don't intend on draining this, but the business that we uh, are going to take up tonight, we've kind of gone over it already, is look at that uh, first cut of the changes that we've made from last year's budget. We call those priorities, kind of puts and takes uh, things that we might want to do as a board to advance our our strategic objectives, um, then look at tax rates, and uh, also look at, uh, like I said, set the tuition rates. Uh, next month, just for a, a preview, we'll be you know, really voting on those, those um, decisions that we make as a board that affect the budget, and then uh, looking at uh, the, the fully baked final tax rates. So here's some, some school finance basics. And a lot of this is vocabulary. You're going to hear some things uh, tossed around. And you need to understand, you know, kind of what is uh, you know, education spending, right? And so you can take your entire budget, and there's a portion of the budget that we collect from taxpayers, and there's a portion that we raise through grant funding or tuition, those sorts of things we call local revenue. You take local revenue away from the total and it gives you your education spending. That's how much falls to the taxpayer. And that's what dictates your tax rates. You take your education spending and you divide it by the total number of uh, equalized pupils you have. That's a term of art. There are formulas that go into uh, calculating uh, what's an equalized pupil. Not every student counts the same. For instance, a pre-K kid counts for 0.46. A second um, English as a second language learner counts for almost two, right? So there's different different weights that are given to various students. But you divide your education spending by your total equalized pupils, and that gives you your per pupil spend. And then the state has a, a concept called the yield. They essentially look at how much money is in the state education fund, which gets distributed out into school districts each year, and they come up with a number that's based on a formula. And you do, it's called the yield, and you you do, that's a statewide thing, and you divide your per pupil spend um, by the yield, and that's what gives you an equalized tax rate. That's the tax rate that's the the same across the school district before you do any calculations to apply it to any uh, individual town. And the thing that changes it for an individual town is called the common level of appraisal. The state takes a, an inventory each year of um, the, the grand lists in each town, the real estate values and the movement of the real estate market. And they make an assessment about how accurate the, the grand list is, the appraised values on the grand list. And they'll make a, they'll assign an adjustment factor essentially to, to make it so that your, your uh, grand list values are current, right? So that gets divided and that's how you get to the tax rates at the town level. We're not going to get into that tonight. The CLAs don't come out till later in the year, but just know as a heads up that that, that will uh, that will be a factor in the calculation. Okay, just a, a couple of, of items just to give you a, a, a sense of what, how the school district spends money. This um, isn't from the current budget. This is from last year, but it, it it will it's in the ballpark, right? But as you can see, the money that we spend by category of spend is mostly people. 
right? That's really the point here, right? You get 53% on wages, 23% on benefits. You're already over three quarters of the budget on people costs, right? And then a bunch of services costs that also include, you know, people sorts of things, but those are more hired services. The expenses by program, you can see here, um, just the things that the, the, the school district sets out to do. Um, it's a, a breakdown here on this slide. Again, these will be available. This is for FY24. This is a pie chart that uh, Jim had prepared. And again, the general education and special education there are, are you know, half the budget. Okay, um, maybe uh, for some of the uh, budget documents, Jim, is there uh, anything you wanted to, to cover here on either the, uh, I guess, a summary of, of kind of how we got to the, the current budget, or do uh, you want me to just give a, a rundown of these things that are coming in the future? So quickly, I can give you an idea of how we got where we are. Okay. Right. Um, what happens in the summer and the early, early fall is the principals get with their teachers and get lists from the teachers of what they want to buy, what they need, what they what they need to run next year's programs. Uh, we sit with the principals and we go over staffing, um, what programs are going to need. We talk about um, are we can we eliminate the staff? Do we need to add a staff? All those things. I spend some time with facilities. I spend some time with food service. Uh, and we and some time with uh, special ed, and we put together all the components of the budget. Uh, this goes on through mid October when it all ends up in my desk. And I put it together in a summary, and we did that this year and got a budget that um, <clears throat> didn't make us feel real good. And we spent some time analyzing what the impact, what was impacting it, and why. And then last Thursday, we sat in this room with the um, principals and all of our uh, key leaders, and we carved some money out of our request because we felt it was too much. So some of the things that we're dealing with is a 12.7% increase in health insurance. We have collecting, collective bargaining agreements for our teachers that are in place. We have one for our support staff that should be in place shortly. Um, but those are kind of things that we um, are legal obligations once you do them. One of the things we're dealing with, something as simple as the heating oil at the high school, which we budgeted 120,000 this year before the war, um, before Russia invaded last year, we're budgeting at a quarter million dollars next year for the same number of gallons of oil. What's so the price per gallon? Um, we budgeted right now, we're paying three dollars and something, and we budgeted it four dollars. Um, but this is what we're, we're looking at. Uh, fortunately, we've converted all our other buildings except for this one, the propane, and we're looking at across the district about a twenty thousand dollar increase in propane budgets throughout the district. So, uh, we've done a pretty good job with that, and timing was good. But those are some of the things we're dealing with. So yeah, great. So um, ultimately, there'll be these three documents that will go up on the, the website for, for um, you know, taxpayers and voters and everybody interested to have a look at, including, as we've done the last couple of years, our full line item budget so people can get full transparency. Hey, Jim, can we go back to page eight screen? Sure. So that's the expense by category, being the chair of buildings and grounds. Um, what line is there showing that? How much is um, towards capital replacement? I see a capital, but it says capital purchases, and it says 1%. Right. This is from last one. Year. I don't know if you recall. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I'm just saying, you know, so you have wages is 50. I'm sorry, my eyes are going. 53 or 57? 53, yeah. 53. The benefits are 23. That's 76% of the total budget, which is better than it used to be. You know, I personally think that over 80% those two items there. But you know, so capital, capital expenses to take care of all the schools that we have middle school, high school, and I don't know, four or five other elementary schools. How much are we preparing for that? 
And I, mean, I think we had, I, I believe we had 750,000 and, and we were told that again last year, but I think that got cut somewhere at the 350 or 375. Well, and, and let me try to answer your question, Jim. Um, we have two projects next summer, maybe three, they're be being funded with grants. So they're coming right out of the budget and they're not showing up. So because of that, uh, and I'm looking for the line, and of course I can't find it because we're in the middle of the conversation. Uh, Joe and I brought forward about $550,000 in capital projects, um, big projects out of the capital improvements plan. And as we were sitting here cutting, we dropped one of those projects because we have so much going on in Killington, especially with the roof project that we felt that this was a project we had to push out for one more year in Killington. So we dropped the $120,000 project and killing and push it back one. But I'm just sticking to this chart. We yep. percentages. So I'm trying to see where capital um, replacement. It's it's all part of the BG wedge on that. Where, where is BG? I'm sorry, I might I'm really so it's yellow. So yellow. You can see on this one, BG is purple. Right. right. That's your right. so my color line. What is the number? 12.9, so 13%. 13%. And, in, and, and inside that 13%, what categories fall in there? How much is that is actually? So is BNG also including that 12%? Is that including salaries? For That's the including the wages, benefits, so then fuel. Again, like, so on that 13%, they could go to 100%. And then out of there, how much of that is 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 um, for personnel and benefits? And how much actually gets out of that 100%? of the 13% to fixing the buildings that we currently have, which is one of the things that every, if anyone's been here for a while knows that, you know, this is one of my big topics and I am the chair of those grounds, but I'm trying to figure out. So, so $541,000 is specifically going into capital improvements from the capital improvements plan that we wrote last year. And then about two hundred thousand dollars more is spread among all the buildings for things like this this year or last year we spent a lot of money the heating system at the high school for that type of ongoing building. Some maintenance. of that is the grants which Ben got into. No, the grants aren't even in here. The grants are above and beyond. Some of the things that you're talking about. So we're spending close to a million dollars on buildings next year, of which a half is coming out of grants. The other half is here and. We will be bringing forward the bond for the roof for killing. Okay, so five hundred thousand is in the budget. Five forty one is in the budget. Five forty one is brought into the budget, and the total budget after we get our screen one, how much is actually being charged to the taxpayers? Let's say we have a twenty three million dollar budget. There are some grant money, as you had said, that came in, or the level money coming in for the students that don't go that don't live in our district. How much of is that actually really the budget? So, million? so, so the the total B and G budget, five forty one. That's actually cash going out. The, the total B and G budget is three million and thousand dollars plus uh, three hundred ninety nine. So, uh, three point four million dollars is the total B and G budget. Yeah, of which five forty one is the building specifically. So, so the, the, the three million dollars is a bond. No, this has nothing to do with the bond. Well, the total taxpayer-supported budget for next year for B and G is three point four million dollars. No, not. Yeah, it is. You, you just told me that out of that two million dollars is a bond for a no, no. Project. In addition to that, is the roof at Killington. In addition to that, okay. So, what is the three million dollars? Three, three. That, that that we're spending on. Stuff that is funded by the taxpayers. Three three point four million dollars I mean, I mean, is custodian wages, custodian benefits. Yeah, oh, okay, so now we're back in the circle. I had soil and paper, I, all of those said, things. So when I said, and then you came back and said five hundred and forty-one thousand is exactly the amount that is going to be placing current everyday fixings in the building. We we, we already had the discussion. Now, three million dollars. It makes sense. It's three million dollars, so the thirteen percent comes up to one hundred percent, and it's three million. And some eighty-seven percent of that is probably to salaries and benefits. 
And out of that $3 million, the actual money that goes to you had said was $541,000. That's all. Five forty one goes to the capital improvements from the capital improvements plan. That's all I asked. Yeah. All right. That's all I asked. Great. All right. So those are the docs that will go up on the website uh, for the taxpayers to see. These are the key factors and assumptions. And this is a slide that we should spend a little bit of time with. Jim alluded to a couple of these, but these are essentially the things that can uh, really heavily impact the budget. So uh, the tw uh, Jim talked earlier in his presentation tonight about uh, the uh, auditors being here. Audits happen on a one-year delay. The, the fiscal year needs to be completed in order for the auditors to look and see how we performed against the, the budgeted uh, monies. Um, we did really well last year uh, with the uh, 21 audit. We had a, a pretty significant surplus, and we expect the same for, for FY22. We don't know the number. Uh, we'll get that from the auditors in time. Uh, enrollment, uh, we heard from Rap and Jim at our last board meeting that we, we lost a bunch of students, right? Uh, most of those students, and this isn't necessarily good news, were um, tuition paying students. Those, those don't count into your equalized pupil count, right? The, the money that we get from tuition actually goes to that category of money uh, that we call local revenue. Uh, it just dumps into the budget. Uh, it, it, it affects um, tax rates the same though, because every amount of uh, money that you get from, uh, from a tuition kid, you don't have to raise from the taxpayers. But anyway, um, on the uh, enrollment front for equalized pupils, we got numbers from Brad James at the Agency of Education just uh, this afternoon, and those numbers were a little bit better than expected. Part of this is the results of the new waiting study that the state completed this year. So if we, uh, without the waiting study, uh, we previously calculated this number to be uh, down something like 20 students, but it looks like with the new waiting factors uh, for the equalized pupil counts, that will uh, only be down around eight students, and that's a that's uh, that's a that's very good good news in term in a uh, you know a line item that uh, could could have really hurt us because the most important thing in all of this is how many kids you have right that that affects affects tax rates. Um, the next thing is uh, the Ed Fund, right? All the the money that's collected from taxes uh, across the state gets pooled in the education fund. There are other sources that get dumped in there, tax revenues from gasoline taxes, property transfer taxes. Last year, we the Ed Fund was incredibly flush because there was a, a ton of federal money that poured through the state and a lot of people moving here. And as a result, there was a, a 90, uh, $90 million surplus that got invested. Uh, the legislature decided to invest a big portion of that back into uh, you know, reducing tax rates. That was great. We can't expect that to happen again, right? So we're, we're, we're going to probably see that come down quite a bit. Um, the yield number, we're doing this on an estimated basis. We expect the yield to, to uh, increase. And as the yield goes up, tax rates go down. So that's, uh, that's good. Uh, but the, the yield number last year, we, it tends to go up by about, you know, under normal conditions, by about 10% each year. That's really all we can do at this point is just estimate it. And that's what we're using for our, our current calculations. Health insurance, this was a big kick in the gut. We, uh, the, the increase last year was around uh, 5% to give you a sense of what that cost was about $100,000. And this year it's gonna be 12 and a half. So we can, we can look at about you know, 250K uh, to the budget. Um, increases staff pay, like Jim said, that's all part of the contract. Um, so we, we know we know that number is is uh, going to be um, because I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, do you, do you know what that line item is in the budget? What we're looking at for the teachers? I do for the support staff until the contract signed. I don't. Yeah, right. I'm That's, unable to release it. I'm just I'm just trying to get everybody's sense of what that number might be. I'm going to tell you combined is probably around half a million though. Okay, about five hundred ten. Okay, and then um, the excess uh, spending threshold. That's a number that we. Uh, have paid very close attention to in the past because there's a, a thing that I didn't cover in the finance basics called a penalty phase. And the reason I didn't cover it is that it's, it's not applicable. It was suspended by the state. They, they don't publish an excess spending threshold. But essentially, when you calculate your per pupil spend, the state says, you know, there's a number that you can't exceed. 
And if your school district is spending more than that, then we're going to charge uh, more money. That's a, a penalty um, to those districts. But they don't do that uh, for, they didn't do it last year. They're not doing it this year. It's been suspended, I believe, for a period of five years. And we'll see. The, the thought is that with the, the new weighting study uh, results, that it may go away forever, but we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to see. And then the CLA, as I said earlier, those are all uh, to be determined. We'll get those later. So here's the, the big reveal um, in terms of, as you can see here, the uh, expense budget, that's that's the overall budget, that top line, right? You can see uh, we put four years here so everyone can see kind of how budgets grow. You now have a sense of the things that make the budget uh, grow over time, uh, paying your people more, you know, all those other factors. The, the local revenues, that's that number, uh, the grant funding tuition uh, that comes in, that also, um, you know, it, it fluctuates with time, but it looks like it's a little bit lower this year than it uh, was last year on a projection. And then ed spending uh, continues to go up, looking at a pretty significant uh, increase from 23 to 24. Uh, and then the per pupil spend, uh, that's the, uh, you know, that number gets uh, uh, divided uh, by your, your total equalized pupils to get down to your tax rate. And as uh, I indicated on the prior slide, uh, it's consistent with the yield, the tax rate looks like it's going to jump, um, you know, up to about what it, almost as much as it was in FY22 on an equalized basis. And so we're looking at about a 5.7% increase uh, for this upcoming year uh, as an early look at the tax rates. So that's consistent with, you know, kind of what we've seen um, over, over time, uh, once the CLAs get applied, I imagine that will be, uh, you know, even more significant. Because most, most towns have seen a lot of increases in, in uh, uh, real estate value and haven't reappraised to the pre-baseline there. Um, let me, before we get into the discussion on setting tuition rates, uh, let me stop there because that's a lot of information and not all that much time. Uh, questions on where we are? Jim. So last year when we were doing the FY23, we came out with numbers, the dollar amount that you're talking about for, um, the $90 million, I think they gave whatever, 35, 40 million, whatever it was, mm -hmm. was supposed to lower the taxes. But in the town of Killington, if you go to um, the this, this, this slide that we used last year showing us that the tax rate before that money going in was supposed to be total under $2 or whatever, uh, we ended up over 202. You did, yeah. You know, so, um, so if I just take, um, the dollar sixty at this point going from a dollar fifty one five, and so there's eight eight almost nine cents there. And I take anybody wants to know anything about the CLA, either as Ben or myself, whatever. But the CLA is really based on the two year trailing average or whatever. So um, the town of Killing has been forced into a reappraisal coming up. I believe Woodstock has been forced into a reappraisal. Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> But our CLA for this current tax year was around a 25% penalty, I believe it was. And we're most likely going to see that increase with the way places are selling. So with this number here for Killington, we're gonna be looking at going from $2.01 or 202 right around there to probably 225, 230. Just to throw it out there. Mm -hmm. And Killington, for the last two or three years, has always said, even maybe longer, I don't know when Jennifer was last on the board or whatever, you know, we, we, we've had these things come in first and say we're not comfortable with a double digit increase. And we were the only ones that were getting the double increase. And we truly believe in the education of our students here. That's the one thing. I can say for Killington, I don't speak for the other towns because I'm not in them, but we're going from 14% to whatever, even though last year we thought we were going to be underneath the 10%, we ended up. So just keep in mind that there's a 
large group of people in Carrington are, I don't know how that's going to work out with the rest of the goal. So you guys are going to reappraise next year. Um, well, we have to reappraise, I believe, for 24, 25. But, you know, this is my last term on this board. I, I'm 62 years old in February, and I'm not signing back up again. But um, I, my daughters went through the system 19, 21, 25, 23, 25. And it's a great district. But um, don't get caught because let's take the houses and Woodstock is being forced into a reappraisal. So that means your properties are selling for more than 20 or 25 percent than what they're actually on the grant list for. And some of your places you're seeing are 50 percent more or whatever. So let's say my house is at Five hundred thousand dollars in the town of Killington, one of my properties, um, and I'm paying two dollars per. So the five hundred goes down to five thousand divided by a hundred times the two dollars. I'm paying ten thousand dollars just for educational taxes at this time on one of my three properties. So that house, when we're done with the reappraisal, is going to go to a million dollars. Okay, and that million will get divided by a hundred. So now I'll be at 10,000. And if the tax rate comes down to the base, because now there's no more CLA, the CLA is at a hundred, mm -hmm. you know, don't get tricked by that because my $10,000 bill now will be $16,000. Okay. Right. Dollars and standards. So a dollar 60 on a million, I'd rather pay $2 on 500, but now it's going to be a dollar 60 on a million dollar house. Um, we talk about wanting to increase our population and everything. I mean, this taxing system is going to force a lot of people um, that have kids, you're not going to be able to live here or whatever. I mean, I, I own three properties in town. I'm probably already paying close to 30 grand in education tax, and I'm going to go to $60,000. It's a cost of business, but I don't know if they're going to get the same issue that I am. So just don't get caught up on your taxes are going to get cut because once they do that reappraisal, just because the tax rate goes down, folks. Right. And don't think they're going to lower that tax rate because then you sit in front of your um, House representatives and your senators and everything, and they'll tell you that the pension fund for mm -hmm. all state employees, I'm not going to put it on to the school all say like they're in eight billion dollar bets. So thank you. Uh Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no. Is there are there any questions from anyone else? Okay, now let's go to our business for the evening. Uh, and that is uh, setting the tuition rates. I, I phrase this as a as a motion, but I'm gonna um show some helpful information that uh, Jim and uh, pulled together for us. And that is, I make it big a little bit. Wait a minute. No, sorry. Do, do, do. You know, I'm gonna stop my share for a second, come back. Sorry, I thought I had this teed up, but we're going to take a look at um, the uh, here we go. Okay, we're going to take a look at the uh, tuition. Um, go back to the Zoom, share the screen. Okay. The, the trends here. Todd would really like to give kudos for showing you, showing everybody your inbox. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Uh, I think. Uh, let's see. I don't know if, if anybody uh, can see those in the room uh, or even at home. Um, trying to show some trends here. So. Um, helpfully, last year as a board, we uh, made the decision on the recommendation of Jim and the Finance Committee 
Um, this has always been a controversial topic, right? <clears throat> Setting tuition yeah. rates. We've had some knockdown drag outs. Um, Ray, see you on the screen. <laughs> it's an issue I know is near and dear to your heart, sir. Uh, but the advice that Jim gave was let's just uh, find an index, right? Uh, consumer price index and, and peg the tuition rates to that, right? And so each year, essentially what an index does is it tells you how much, uh, you know, kind of money is, is subject to inflation. And so the, the tuition rates that we've, we've set uh, in the past, mm -hmm. instead of having to you know, do all kinds of benchmarking and value judgments, uh, we just say, here's what we're going to use to make tuition decisions. It worked very well for us last year. Last year, that uh, index told us that, um, you know, Inflation was 2.62. This year, the indexes are telling us that it's 3.5. We've all seen in the news that you know inflation is a, a significant factor for all kinds of industries. But uh, for helpful uh, information here, Jim's pulled together some benchmarks, right? And you can see in column A here, there's a bunch of, uh, this is just years going back to 2016. And um, what the in uh, under the high school you see at the top of the screen here are what we charge for tuition going back to 2016, and then what um, several other comparable school districts charge for tuition going back to 2016. And we don't obviously have any numbers for this year, but you know last year um, you know there were a number of schools who were more expensive than we were, right, and a number of schools who were less expensive. Uh, for the for the middle school high school tuition, so the recommendation, and you see on the the motion back in my slide deck, is that we raise tuition based on that same methodology uh, to nineteen thousand six forty nine at the middle school and high school, and then for elementary school, again using that three point five percent inflator, we raise uh, elementary tuition to seventeen thousand, and there again you can see uh, some comparable schools in what they charged for tuition last year, some more expensive, some less. So we're at $575 on the elementary school. Okay there, buddy. Okay. Okay, so that's what that's based on. Uh, is anybody having trouble seeing this? I can I can try to, to blow it up. Um, we can also make this available to folks, but. Um, then on the map, we're up, if I look at it right, it's the elementary school is 16425. Yep, and it's going seventeen. So it's yeah, six seventy five hundred six hundred five seventy five hundred five hundred five hundred five hundred. You know, and and for everybody that's kind of new on this board or whatever, the reason why this always comes up is you'll see Ray Rice sitting over there that doesn't have a vote in the board. He's from Pittsfield. They are part of our district, really, and they do send quite a few kids to our school district. And we're trying to keep it that. So if we go to the element, if we go to the middle school, high school, even though it's three point five percent, you know, um, we're going up from what is that eighteen nine something to nineteen about seven hundred bucks, seven hundred dollars. So this is where I would normally say, you know, we're asking ready for, and he's going to come in as jolly old self or whatever. So we're ready for you, right? <laughs> I'm jolly. <laughs> keep going ben you do an amazing job at this i have been on these boards for 12 or 13 years and it took a long time to bend my brain around this and, and you guys do a great job so just go ahead and proceed and Pitchfield is behind you 100 percent. thank you very much thank you ray you're you're a prince all right let's uh go back to the the powerpoint then um this is how we got to those numbers um do I have a motion to set the tuition rates for FY24 at the numbers indicated? So moved. Second. Second. Speeches now. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye or raise your aye. hand. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Great. That concludes Thanks, the finance presentation. Well, thank you very much. You make, well done. Math makes sense to me. <laughs> All right. Um, the policy committee update. Yep. 
So we have four policies to discuss, two policies that are uh, up for adoption from uh, the last uh, general meeting. And the first one is the C1 educational records. And as was discussed, basically uh, the reason for updating it uh, as per actually the Vermont School Board Association was to just make sure it was up to date with purple rules. And to be honest with you, that's really all it was actually in the, um, in the uh, Addendum at the end is just a definition of uh, what a, actually what a record is and what a school official is, and there's a language about access and opting out and a deadline. So um, you had your first meeting, whatever, and you were here for adoption. I make a motion to adopt the C1 education records. So I'm going to second it. Is there a second? second? Okay. Uh, any questions? Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? I wasn't involved in the last two. That's all. All right. Do we want, we want to record Jim? I understand because I, okay. didn't, I don't think it's fair to kind of move it along. Okay, the second one is uh, also for adoption is F2 non discriminatory mascots and school branding. This is uh, this policy is uh, essentially to review and make sure our branding mascots are in compliance with a uh, new law, Act 152, which actually the deadline, I believe, is January 1st, 2023. Uh, and so, um, but once again, this is a state thing or whatever. So, you yep. guys are here today for adoption, so I make a motion to adopt F2 non discriminatory mascots and school branding. I hear a second. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I would love to say it, but I just wasn't here during it. Any so. opposed? Jim, did you abstain? I just abstain. Okay. All right, and we're here tonight for a first reading of the amendments to grading policy. Right, and the capital debt repayment. And capital debt. So um, just as an overview, the per as, as discussed at the meeting, the purpose of, uh, of the policy and the changes was really to, uh, there was some specificity that we wanted to broaden that they were, um, so we wanted to allow the integration of what is now three separate uh, systems, including scheduling, grades, and assignment into one system, which has the capacity to do it, but it actually is being unutilized. And it's basically uh, is to facilitate uh, this interaction of all these systems into one system. It's easier to maneuver for the students and also for administration. For instance, things have to be transferred. Students would have to, in the old system, go to different systems to just to check various things. This would be integrating the whole thing. Part of it was also that there would be elimination of the decaying average system. And apparently it was a survey that students found this very stressful. And there was also a, a tweak to that howl, which instead of being set at 5%, was going to now be something like 5 or 10 percent. That is the basic idea of the policy. There was not it was some tweaking to make it more general, usable, and not to completely make a sea change in the policy. And that's it. And that was great. Yeah. Yes. So um I mean I think I already gave a big enough in the beginning. Um I am one that is transparent. I reached out to first to the, the new um chair of the board. When I saw this up, and then from there, I went to um, Elliot as the chair of the policy committee. And from there, I got a phone call from Raf that came out on the phone. So, you know, I'm not going to get as uh, vibrant as um, Todd was earlier, whatever, about something news or whatever. But, you know, the discussion that I had with Raf was is that we're not really even sure we're going to get this new computer system to wrap in. Okay. But what I've just told here is that we're trying to get something so it all rolls in. So my you know, we listened here about um how the project of a graduate and all this other stuff has been along and we listened to the uh, statement 
talking about it's you know it's been a long process and everything part of that was the grading system in there and when i go through here and, and it's kind of funny because when i got permission to go in that one time i was looking at it and i was able to go into you know the board book and pull up there was a red line document in there at that time um, today when i'm pulling it up there's not a red line document so I'm, I'm looking at something here that's not really getting to me but i'm being told that one of the one of the big things back in 2000 and it was long before the thing was adopted because it took almost two or three years to adopt this because the process that we had with the community members that were going crazy over some new rating system. Um, I took two or three years to sit down with everybody and go through here. So here are my concerns. It talks about on here, it says the aspect, the aspects of traditional grading realized, the letter grade and four point GPA reporting. And it goes on and it says that the student performance would be reported using traditional letter grades and a four point grade scale for summative assessments and report card and a four point GPA for transcript. So it gets to the report cards and the transcripts. I know that we had a thing that worked because I, I really did spend almost over two years and I think there could be changes to what, but you're asking me now to, or everybody else to make a, a change, yet we don't have the red line in front of us anymore. But um, there was 11 different grade points and I don't really see the 11 different grade points in here at this time, um, maybe I'm going blind, um, but in the standard base, it's talking about the weighting change and everything of four point. And, and we watch, we watch this presentation tonight on proficiency-based grading, where you have a scale and a circle that had a one and a two and a three and a four. And part of the hybrid system that we tried to work back in those two years was to combine that one, two, three, or four into this other thing. I sat with six teachers doing this process back in 2018, I think, before it came out. Carrie, I, I, I will say, because Carrie was one of the teachers or whatever, um, I'm not sure how she stood at that time, but. I sat in and I listened to some teachers tell me that I really would have liked, I can't give, I can't give the kid a four, um, but I really don't want to give a three. So that's why we came up with this 3.5, okay? And I don't know, am I, I'm trying to find it here, right? Yeah, it's right here. So under four point grading scale, student performance would be reported are reported using a four-point grade scale with increments in between each whole number, equaling 11 possible grades. So I think that's what you're talking about, right? Like if it's if a teacher, and normally we do that on like a 0.3 and a 0.7 interval. So if, if a teacher wanted to give a 3.3, something that was a little bit above a three or a 3.7, something that was a little bit below a four. Um, so that hasn't changed in that. Right. So, but one of the other things that the parents were really on was this letter grading thing. Yep. And and so and this is this is why like I don't think I'm against first of all I don't think I'm against the grading system changing. What I'm against is is that we had like 400 and Raph, you lived it. I mean, I, I don't want this board sitting there going through this again. I think it's I think there's a lot of good in here, but I think if you just once again now come out. I make a motion to adopt this at the next meeting. No, I didn't. Okay. But let's say I did. All right. You're going to have, we didn't go out. The community doesn't know it. I mean, we got to get, we sent so much information, Sherry, out to the parents by email doing all this. That's what I'm talking about. And I sit here in this room for like 12 years or whatever. We talk about being transparent. And it's like, so maybe I didn't present. Is, can you just go over what the changes from the other policy are? Maybe I maybe I glossed over it. And... Yeah, I mean, Jim, you're right. So, so like the 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 letter grade that was a big piece. That's in. I mean, that hasn't changed. Um, that that's still in there. Um, I think really, I mean, and, and first of all, like 
this policy has served us well. I think it's really important to acknowledge the work that went into this policy and how well we have been served by this policy. We were we received a commendation from the AOE around our grading work. Like so, it's it's this is so there there was really no intent to change this this piece. And 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 I think there's I personally have been served well by this policy and the clarity it provides. The issue really came down to right now, the specificity of this policy means that as far as I know, there's only one software that we can use. And that's the software that we have right now, Jumbo. And it's the only one that we can use that meets all of these different criteria. Um, feedback that we've heard from some students and parents and teachers is that transitioning between different software packages for going to Alma to find your schedule, going to Jumbo <clears throat> to find your grades, going to Google Classroom to do your work. And the question that we got, is there a way to, to, to streamline that? And so those that was the beginning of the change. Um, and so those pieces were around um, the summative assessment weight values. So like how much more a different piece was, um, the howls being exactly 5%. And then the decaying average. Um, so those were the those were the changes um, that were that were proposed. I agree. Like we 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 lived through this whole thing. thing. So everybody knows here. Like Raph and I get we went and there's never an argument. Okay, <laughs> it's a difference of opinion here. But I'm going to stick here to the howl and going back to what the process was and the way it's saying it here. In the, in, when it was specific, whatever it said, five percent of your grade. Shall be shall be um, your how grade, and this is saying the assessment will be a small portion of each course grade, less than ten percent. What the board back then, with these four hundred different survey sent back, I think it's the largest one that we ever got. Okay, was to make it so that if 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 Bryce and I are back in tenth grade, God forbid me, teachers, but if we back in tenth grade. And Bryce had English teacher A, and I had English teacher B. And so that's letting you say that Bryce's teacher is going to say that the Howells is worth 9% of the total grade. And my teacher is going to say it's 2%. And we were trying to make, I guess it's the new word in the last 10 years, equitable. And if you give a staff member the chance to say up, not it has to be less than 10%. So that's not equitable. And, and that's that's what people wanted because these kids and they start dropping out of, I don't want that teacher. I'm gonna get 9% of this one and this one's only gonna be 3%. So 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 that I'm just gonna go through that was one of the issues why it was so specific. So the other one was the decaying average. Now, a decaying average, I don't care if you're 100 years old. You went to school, you had decaying average. You, your, your final exam is worth more than your other marking periods. Your, your, your midterm is worth more. So when we went through proficiency-based grading, and believe me, I went through, I studied proficiency-based grading for two years. I actually wish proficiency-based grading, Jen might think on when she hears me say this, I kind of wish it was there for me when I went through school. She's sitting over there like I'm saying this stuff and I'm not attacking proficiency-based grading, but it's, 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 we've had the king, there's three ways and, in proficiency-based grading, there's three different ways of grading. One of them is the K. One of them is what your final score was at the end of the year. So we've heard like in the proficiency part of this meeting today of the graduating to get to and what you're at the end. And that's one way. And when we sat there as a board with the parents, there are some kids that don't do well on finals. So you so you put a different decay on that. It's it's not a hundred percent. You know, I went to a school, a high school, and there were certain classes I really didn't like to take, but I had to take them. And we had six report cards. We had seven. 
We had six report cards that were marking periods, and then we had the final exam. The final exam counted as two times the grade. I could get an F on all six marking periods, and I get an A on the final exam. And four times two is eight divided by eight. I got a D. I got through home ec or whatever, or machine shop. There's always decaying out. So what? So when you you're asking you're asking this board to approve this new policy. Number one, you don't even know if you're going to change the computer system that the other one works with. Okay, and number two, you're not telling me what what average you're using, and 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 so how can I do that? I mean, there there's another thing in here like. The extra credit retaken assignments. The whole idea, Jen, behind proficiency based grading is to take a student that maybe takes longer to learn, and we're all trying to get them there. Okay. But this goes on to say that somewhere in here says, oh, yeah, at, so extra credit and retaking assignments. So the whole idea of this new proficiency-based grading system, well, now it's probably 15 years old or whatever, is that a student may have to take the test over. But we have something in here that says it's at the teacher's discretion. So once again, Bryce's teacher lets him take over the test. My teacher doesn't. Where is the equitable in there? And this is why I think we should take this program and you know what? I'm going to use the word, I've been on this board for too long, a little respect that when someone put in so much work to this grading system, going through the teachers, going through Garen, going through surveys, <laughs> that I would have been contacted because I then would have sat down and I would have went through. And I think we really could come up with something like you're talking about rather than have that conversation, but to sit here for a first reading, it, you know, it just kind of proves, you know, Todd, never say you're sorry, because I never said I was sorry. I'm glad that I see somebody that maybe will replace me, and you have to sometimes hold people to accountability. We wouldn't have had conflict open if I didn't go against, and I'm asking for respect here that you take this thing, you table it, you allow me, and not just me, with the other people that were involved and sit down with Jen and Raph. That's what I'm asking for. And if I don't get it, then, you know, whatever, I'm a big fan. My kids don't go to school there. No. I feel like hard. Grace has had to stand up. Then, um, Do you move to vote? <laughs> I think we should have a little bit more discussion, but we do need to limit the other things. I'll, to be, do I'll be quick. Um, most people know that I'm pretty big on intention, I guess, between first and second reading, if that's what the outcome is tonight. I think it would be nice, like as, as, a, as a parent, to understand the intent of the district for these changes. It sounds like there's only three substantial changes. Um, I think, you know, hearing what those changes were at first, I think, oh, why? But then getting on one software, again, as a parent, super exciting because I, I really dislike the different software systems and how we have to juggle between them. So um, I do think that uh, there might be some value in sending something out to, to parents just to collect that, that feedback as a data point for the board to understand that the support of the, the parents is also kind of there. Um, how you come up with a survey like that, that's complex to get, to get the, the information we need. Um, but I but I get it. The the uh Jim did make some good points, but I, I think that I think that his points about equity I do actually echo with me more so than the other changes. If you're changing how it's from five to ten percent, ten percent, no big deal. Maybe that supports the, the the portrait in our strategic plan better. I could see that being the case. If it does give leeway for teachers, I know when I was in high school, some teachers homework counted 30% of total grades, some counted 10%. 
you could play the game, right? There's some classes I didn't do a lick of homework for ever, not even one assignment, because <laughs> I knew I could still get an A minus, right? Um, so I, I do worry about about that. So I guess yeah, shame on me for not doing my homework and looking at the original compared to this. Um, but it's it is nice to have, I guess, the three main call outs. I think should be the the question because it sounds like that's what the intent is around. And then I'll just have to go back and look and see where those deletions there were made. If there's some other words cut out, because I do worry a little bit about making sure our language that matches the intent at the end. Then, is this time sensitive? The passage of this policy, like, do we have to have it done by the summer? No, no. I I, I think we're we're operating in a position of of strength. If we if we want, and 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 honestly, the intent was. Um, we would the reason I said we didn't know what we were going to do is because if we change our policy, we need to do a thorough evaluation. We need to bring forward some options for, for people to look for. We need to bring that before students. We need to bring that before teachers. We need to bring that before parents. And in order to do that, if we if we wanted to make a change by next year, we'd have to make that decision by February. Okay. But it does not need to be done today. Motion to table the first reading for the next meeting. Second. Okay. All those in favor of tabling till uh, next month. Aye. 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 Thank okay. you. Any opposed? And if you could just sit down with yeah. uh, Grant and Brad and, and bring other people in. To, yeah. I think we're going to get there. So. I do want to just ask one quick thing, just super quick, if you don't mind. Okay. Can we just get a, because Raph and Jen are like so good at, the charts and graphs and explaining people to dumb thing, dumb people like me. Can you just can you do some sort of matrix where you just show like what it was and what you want it to be and why? Because I'm sure it would be compelling and amazing and really help people understand, even outside of this board and the public in general. And then and then when you guys get into the nitty gritty because you're experts on it and with Jim's experience and so on and so forth. But just for me, who knows absolutely zero percent of what you're talking about, uh, coming a matrix coming from the two of you would be so helpful for me to understand what you're even talking about. And I know it'd be helpful to other parents as well. Just something to consider, you know? But just logistically, we bring this up for the next board uh, policy committee and work it out then because how are we going to do words in the thing? I think you bring it, bring it back when you're ready to bring it back. I don't think it's next month. I think you have to go through a certain thing. You have to get information, but Right, but how many people can work on words? I mean, we can work the four of us, I guess. Right? Is that, is that okay? I mean, I'm just talking about open meeting. And I just want to make sure that everyone understands. Uh, I'm I'm always here for sticking up for the students first, and um, the taxpayers second. And it was, you know. There's a lot of people, it's not just me, there's a lot of people that put a lot of work into this program, and there's always room for improvement on a program. So let's just, let's just, we tabled it, it's done. Um, let's um, have a discussion of setting up something and Mondays. So technically, Mondays and just from the point of order, I want to ask, or I'm asking my mother's rule, I thought te technically tabling means you're, you're uh, is that actually what we're doing? I, I thought tabling was your your tabling is no not not the big word. It's on hold. Yeah, it's on hold. Okay, I thought it. Okay. I thought it okay. We can come back, and I want to come back because I want to get something, and I know there's probably some issues that if we sit down. All right, we I think we have to move along to. Okay. I, yeah, capital debt uh, repayment policy, and again, the purpose. I'm going to simplify my my concept of it. Is purpose is to address the financial requirements of the new build of the high school middle school. And to prepare the communities for the potential financial um, impact by three different means. One is uh, capping the increase to 16%, which is approximately half of what it would be without any sort of cap. Um, addressing alternate funding and C, three, <laughs> transparent uh, monitoring and reporting along the along the way um, of of that process. And that's what I'm presenting. I would. I wrote this policy. Um, this was actually the culmination of, of quite a bit of work uh, from the administration this summer, from um, the, the, the finance committee, from the new build committee, um, those involved in fundraising. And 
everyone who's kind of looked at uh, how do we pass a bond to get this, this school project off the ground. Um, so what I'd like to do is share my screen again, but before I do that, um, this is this has been a, 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 also a, a collaboration. We had a great session last month between the policy committee and, and uh, I was invited in, the finance, other finance committee members attended. We really did a deep dive. Um, uh, Matt uh, had asked, can, can we get some, some financials, some examples? And uh, I've had a, a, a working uh, model of a spreadsheet that kind of calculates tax rates. And we'll, I sent this to everybody on the policy committee, and I'll make it available to the board, too. And I'll show it to you here in a second. But just high-level stuff, um, the purpose is passing a bond. We looked around the state, and anybody who's tried to pass a bond other than Burlington, who has a ton of kids and relatively low uh, tax rates based on just having a ton of kids, as we saw from the earlier presentation, Nobody else has been able to get a bond through. I guess Winooski did a number of years ago, but it was by like 10 votes, right? Um, everybody else, um, South Burlington, bond vote fails. Um, Waterbury, bond vote fails. Um, Slate Valley, try to have a bond vote fails. You know, this is all for school projects, and these bonds are not close. They're like, like two thirds, four fifths negative, right? Because the, the tax impacts are too high under the, the, finan the financial system. Even if you do get your bond vote passed, the second point I would make is that you have to pass your school budget every year. So even if you can like pack the boat and get your, your bond passed in the first year, it doesn't do you much good if the next year your, your school budget goes down in flames, right? And then you've got to make massive budget cuts. So this is all in anticipation of that. And the, the policy is, is, there's a lot of words in there. There's a lot to get your head around, but it's a mandate to fundraise. It's a mandate to, to beef up the district's capabilities to raise private funding and grant funding, which we started on last year with the $50,000 grant from the Woodstock EDC that allowed us to hire Marlena McNamee, who's here tonight, who's going to give us an update on fundraising. Our, our grant writer um, was, was hired, and it's already um, you know, proving some, some great benefits, right? So that's the idea. And with no further ado, I'm going to show you this, this bond model to demonstrate to the board how it would work in action. And um, this is going to take a little bit of attention, and I know that nobody has any left after three plus hours of board meeting, uh, but I'm very happy if anyone's interested to, to sit down one-on-one -on -one or, or walk through this or, or answer more questions. Uh, so here we go. Come on, screen. Fire it up. Go. All right, here we go. So um, can anybody see what I've got? Uh, this is relatively small, but I will start by showing the idea is um, on the left hand column there, you've got a whole bunch of numbers, essentially, how much money do we have to borrow, right? Currently, we're projecting around, uh, you know, $75 million for this uh, school project. Burlington's, I believe, is, is around 160 million for their, their school projects, just to give you a sense. Um, you know, this isn't like an exorbitant uh, project. We've, we've got this model that 3.75% interest, interest rates rising. This is a number we got from the, the bond bank in July. We'll have to check in with them. Uh, and the, the term of the bond in years is, is 20 years. And um, we're basing this on FY23, that's the current year's tax rates. So all of this over here on the right is your tax rate projections. And if I scroll down, if we tried to pass a bond at $75 million, the first year tax impact would be 36%. That would go down in flames like every other bond vote in the state. So what do you do? You raise money. And um, if you don't just raise money, you have to you have to allocate that money against the debt service. And the debt service, as you'll see here on line 12, is descending, right? Unlike a home mortgage, your debt service starts out high because your principal payment is higher. And they don't, they don't smooth it. Uh, we, we've had these conversations with the bond bank. And uh, over time, your, your debt service uh, you know, uh, gradually decreases to be roughly half of what it is at the start, right? So your tax impacts are going to get lower over time. Yeah. Um, so if you were to raise, let's say, so our, our capital 
goals, as we'll see here in a moment, is a, is a $20 million campaign. But let's say we were able to raise $10 million, right? What does that do? Oop, get my comma out of there. $10 million and you allocate that. Oops, that's not, that's 100,000, sorry. Yeah, yeah, there you go. We allocate that, you know, over the first five years of the bond and you're starting to drop, you know, if you if you can allocate say three and a half towards that first uh, year, then you're already getting in the range, right? But um, that's not really the most important thing about a, a school building. It's not the only tool that we can use to to um, to change the tax rates or to to influence them to bring them down. The first would be to stretch the bond payment, and while that would make the overall project more expensive over time it would make the tax rates lower in, in the early part of the bond, enabling us to it'd be more affordable. So let's drop the amount of money to more like $5, $5 million, right? That we were able to raise, which is I think pretty realistic considering the fact that we've already raised two. Um, so you look at that and over a uh, 30 million, okay, we're getting close, but then you have to look at the, the impact of enrollment. And if you build a new school building and you promote that new school building, you're gonna get more enrollment, right? And so on this tab, I've got uh, the ability to say in the first year, let's say we get, um, I don't know, 10 kids, right? Equalized pupils, as we saw earlier. And then each year after that, we get five more kids because we're active in promoting the school. Those are powerful drivers. And you can see that the, the tax rates you know, um, get impacted by that. The other thing is that um, your school budget, as we saw earlier in the finance presentation, education spending goes up over time. And as education spending goes up, like a home mortgage, your uh, debt payment is fixed and it becomes smaller as a percentage and uh, as an impact to the tax rate. The last two years, we're looking at you know five plus percent um, increases to the school budget, but let's be conservative and say that our school budget, we're able to control spending to keep it around three, and we'll keep our put the yield up at the same amount. We go back and we see that that um, also changes your tax rates over time, right? So you can see that those tax rates with real world numbers are coming into that range of 16 million. So it becomes a fundraising exercise at that point. And you say, okay, um, instead of five, we'll, we'll make it, you know, uh, seven million, right? But you've got, uh, this is just a tool that you can fiddle with. And I'm not trying to waste anybody's time, but just to put the factors all out there, right? To show that this is achievable. And if we make investments in fundraising, and we keep at it, then we, we and we have time. Like we're we're two years away from from having to make a single debt payment. We've already got two million dollars. Let's keep at it, raise more, and you know, once the school building's built, we'll have it. I think an even easier time uh, raising. raising once the what? What's that? Once the what is, we'll have an easier school time. building. Once the school building is built, well, once it's built, it will be easier. What to raise to 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 <laughs> to, to fundraise? Yeah, yeah, because you can, you, well, it's certainly to drive enrollment. So anyway, um, how many students from the district do you think you are actually missing? How many students do you think we're missing? Yeah, who live here yeah. and go to private schools or tuition over to to Lebanon? Yeah, I don't know. I, that would be a number to know. Yeah, if you're if you're basing this on increasing enrollment, you need to know how many students you're not getting right now. Well, we we have we have twenty towns oh. now. 20 towns now that aren't in our school district, you send their kids here, right? To the, the elementary schools and the middle school, high school. But those I, just want to, I just want to look at the tuition to them. They but, wouldn't count. But they do. They well, do I just call a point of order. Okay, I just, I'm, okay, I'm sorry. We, we only ever recognize you as a public. Thank you. I follow this. I, I'm happy to have a conversation about this. Quick point. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I wish I could dream in my own budget going forward if 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 so the question here is this policy is being set up to what go to the taxpayers for a 75 million dollar bond and say once that's passed we're we're going to show 
the people that are going to donate money that the town is, that the district is really interested. Because I know that was a theory like three years ago that, you know, we have to have a bond vote first for people to put up money. Let's remember this, this, this new bill started, I don't know, four or five years ago. Um, and we got $2 million, yes. But let's, let, let's be realistic. The $2 million has specifics to it. One is for a million five, I think, or whatever, but you'd have to spend it on um, different years or whatever. So are we looking at saying to the taxpayers in this March to bond up to $75 million and that will give this new build fundraising group the power to go out and get funds to lower it? That's no. my question. No, we're looking at a smaller bond of around six or seven million this March. And then in the interim in the intervening year, we then go for the larger bond in, in uh, 24. So what is this six or seven million dollars going for? What is it actually going to be used? Two million dollars for a roof on Killington Elementary School, one million dollars to replace the um, uh, steam system with hydronics at the current. That has, nothing to, that has nothing to do with the new bill. 2.7 for plans for the new bill. Okay, so 2.7 million to give to for plans that we've spent how much already over the last four years in plans to X company. I'm being nice, X company. So how much have we already spent there? And when this project started, it was supposed to be a, a project that came forward to allow this group to get funding to try to raise some 20, 25 million towards a 60 million at that time, and now it's $75 million. I just I just want to read something because I knew we were going to get really late into here. So I put it in just to make it, you know, quick. And, and just think about the, the 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 grading policy that we just spoke about, okay? Is it legal for a current board to put in a policy that would control how a future board goes about preparing their budget within a policy? Yes, it is legal for a current school board to accept a policy that attempts to control how a future school board prepares the budget. However, such a policy would not legally bind the future school board. The future board, by the action of a majority of its members, to choose to ignore the policy, amend it, or repeal it. That's what we're doing on a, a grading thing. It, it, if, as the future board sees fit, a policy like this is only effective as long as the majority of the future board members choose to follow it, there would be no enforceable legal remedy that would prevent this. The practical effect is, that, is not that it legally binds the future board, but that it politically binds the board potentially forcing the board to justify to the voters why it hasn't chosen to deviate from the policy. I'm not an expert in statewide education property tax or bonding for school construction, but it seems intuitive that if a district bonds for the construction of a new school, the bond payments will be fixed over the, term, the bond term. And in essence, the taxpayer's obligation to repay the bond is capped by the bond's principal amount, interest rate and term, not the school district's budgetary decisions. Assuming normal school budget and homestead tax rate growth, the percentage of the budget attributable to the cost of the bonding for new school construction will be the highest as you accrue in the first year and decrease over time. In other words, there already is a tax impact cap regardless of annual budget decisions. I'm almost done. If the school district is going to attempt to borrow more than the tax impact cap of 16% and rely on other sources of revenue, example, the alternative funding sources, it actually would put the district taxpayers at greater financial risk as one or more of these sources may never come through or fall short of the expectations. The bond will be a general obligation bond. So if this happens, the taxpayers will still be legally obligated to make bond payments. At that point, the future school board will have no choice but to deviate from the policy and exceed the tax impact cap. So I don't understand if you think you can raise X amount of money, then why don't you just say to the taxpayers, 
we want to go for $40 million bond upon us getting $35 million in grants and you're capped then. To put a policy in place that is going to politically put another group after we're all gone is crazy. It, it's just, and 16%, 16, I, I, when I start getting into this thing, 16% of what? 16% of the budget. And this is why I asked Jim Fenn before how much. It's $541,000, a total of $20 million, which is less than 3%. We're already putting 53% of, 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 of salaries and 23%. So we're already up to 76%. But now you're telling me that the capital, the one building in our district is not going to exceed 16% of the budget. What does that mean? I could raise the budget to $30 million from 23 and it's, and it's 16%, which is higher. It's, it's once again, here we are putting a policy in front of a board for moving to adopt or for a second reading, and yet nobody has this information in front of us. I look at this and it tells me that the tax rate, it's 20, it's gonna go up without any funding from anywhere outside, it will be $26,000 per pupil. So a lot of you people on this board are new and, and we still don't have an answer back from the AOE if, we go over X amount of dollars per student after the five year period or whatever that they've given us, if they're gonna allow this not to be double taxed. Jim, I think we- I'm done, we, I'm done. Thank you. Um, I know that Todd had his hand up in Bryce. I'm gonna go with Bryce. Um, I just wanna make sure that we're here talking about the intent of the policy and the purpose. A lot of this sounds like it's around regular planning, tracking, reporting. The, the list of alternative funding sources, kind of, kind of us saying as a board, our, our guidance for this and current and future boards, right, is to uh, to implement these alternative funding strategies. And um, you know that sixteen percent in these numbers, I know Ben, why you were showing it to to kind of show why this concept is defensible, because I think trying to show the point that. There's there are a lot of unknowns, right? But depending how things shake out, there's different ways that you could obtain a certain number. I think getting hung up on those numbers is not really the point of this, except for the 16%. So if we want to talk about that percentage and have something go back before a second meeting to make modifications, or not necessarily to change the percentage, but to your point to clarify um, the percentage of what, right? To add some language. To, to that, I think that's one thing. But most of this policy is around the fundraising groups in the district having to be transparent reporting stuff. And I think that's just key that we're, we're focusing on that, not so much the, the new any new building itself, because that's not that's not all this policy is, is about. It's specifically around the approach to debt replacement. So I just want to make sure that we're all talking about, about that and not a specific project. Thank you, uh, Todd. Yeah, I think, uh, and this is a, first of all, it's a great chart. Um, I love plug and play. Look, the day I met with Sherry, <clears throat> my first day as a board member, I talked about the bond and why don't we just go to the people and just get it done and whip the votes and figure it out, right? And, and she was like, explain to me why that was crazy, which all those things were valid. But as we get here a year later in some months, and we look at this, I think what, what Jim's saying is you can't saddle. It, it's it's no different than many six or eight board meetings ago when we talked about some infrastructure improvements and buildings and grounds. And we said, uh, I think it was for solar panels or something along this line. And we said, we can't assume, I think this was something that came up with, with the other Jim, we can't assume that other boards are going to vote for this money and we need to figure this out. And that, so this, this is the same vein, right? What we're talking about is there's no one arguing that we need a new school because we all know the school's going to fall apart, right? That's, that's, we can, let's just say we all agree on that. So school's going to fall apart. The problem is what was $60 million yesterday is $75 million to the, tomorrow or today. And it's a hundred million dollars tomorrow. It's $200 million in two years. It, it It's, it's astronomical increases, inflation and otherwise. Um, sure. Pandemics raise prices on certain things and like, you know, a remodel that was a million, maybe it's 900,000 now, but two years ago it was 500, okay? 
So what I what I really would love the, the Woodstock it it baffles me coming from LA and Connecticut <laughs> two affluent places and look I I worked my butt off my whole life fundraising is a big deal and I I laugh because it only takes so many rich people to make all your dreams come true right and the taxpayers are going to say this 16% increase or 18 or 20 it's it's ludicrous like no one's ever going to sign off on that or maybe they will and that would be great but it really takes outside help and philanthropy to push these things across and what do you get with the new school you're going to get another 30 or 40 years of top level education and and for our educators to be able to go and 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 provide you know a private type school a boarding type school experience to local children and local families in this district who deserve that so I would stress just to think about putting something out there that funds it now, not just the idea of plans and this and that, because they're meaningless, because next year they're going to cost twice as much, 30%, and whatever. It's something more. Everyone can agree on that. I would say, could we think about a way? I know, I know nothing about this. I haven't worked in these groups. But as an entrepreneur and someone who's made every dollar from zero given to me, <clears throat> say that what I would what I would stress is that can we go for the big ask and put it contingent on the community, the affluent community stepping up to get this issue solved once and for all for the next 30 or 40 years? Can we say, look, taxpayers, we need to do this $70 million bond or 75 or 85, whatever it might be. But if we don't raise $12 million, we're not going to go and execute. There's something along these lines, which I think is sort of what Jim was getting at in a, in a roundabout way. We can't we can't saddle the future with our decisions of today. It's not it's not the way it's built. But can we just go big and try to get some community members to step up knowing that it's a full-fledged influence on the outcome? So if you told me today, not me because I can't afford it, but if you told me today that, hey, if I give you $10 million, this bond is going to go through and Woodstock and the union will have the best high school anyone's ever seen in Vermont or the Upper Valley for the next 40 years, I might be interested in that as I lay on my deathbed wondering mm -hmm. what to do with my tens of millions of dollars. And there are people around here that are wondering what to do with that money. They're, they're curious, but I feel like in this, in Vermont, in the Upper Valley, what I see is there's not enough ask in a way that shows an immediate return. So maybe there's a way to frame it where we can have that sort of contingency. And that's probably the dumbest idea ever. It makes no sense and a million re reasons why it wouldn't work, but that's my vibe and I wanted to throw it out there. It's just a, yes, Elliot. Just a question. So how do you have something that's a 30 year commitment without saddling the future? I mean, I don't, I don't think that's a possible to do. So, I mean, if you're, fixed cost, if you're having a fixed a cost is a, a fixed cost isn't something that's, uh, you know, any municipal uh, bond. Uh, Elliot probably. has the floor right now. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 just I, was just, I was just answering. I was just answering the question. Sorry. Not a question of a fixed cost. You're you're saddling or whatever the word you're putting a burden on for the future anyway, no matter what you do. And you can't say that we don't want to have a bond, you know, in five years, whatever board is going to want it. We did it. I mean, and they had to do it whatever, how many years ago when this school, school was built and we're thankful that we have a school. And so I don't, I don't see that that's a real you question. You do that with teacher contracts and other fixed costs that increase over time. Claude, could you please raise your hand? Yeah. Sure, but you do that with teacher contracts gonna... and the other fixed costs over time. No, you gotta get called on, Todd. Just put your hands up, don't get you. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being literal, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna put it back to Ben um, at this point. Yeah, sure. I mean, Jim, I'll answer your, your question about uh, why can't we just fundraise all the money up front? Because it can't be done. I'll be honest with you. It can't be done on the timeline that we have with this building. We can't raise 30 or $40 million um, uh, before we have to do something, right? And this plan allows us to raise the money over time. And we do that by investing in fundraising. For example, I reached out to Ber uh, Bergenberg. Right, an independent school. They take money, uh, tuition kids. It's all tuition. They don't take money from the state ed fund, but it's all public money, right, for the most part. And but they have a full time development office with six FTEs, six full time employees, right? And they raise a ton of money for that school, right? And they do it on an annual basis. And that's the idea to get alumni fundraising, to get planned giving, like people putting 
um, you know, our school district and their wills, and then to do capital campaigns, do it around the new school building, do it around achieving net zero, do it around whatever the next initiative is, but do it on an ongoing basis. And as you see here, the reason that I put this chart together is to demonstrate that you don't have to raise $30 million to unlock this school building. You probably only need to raise about five. And once you have that, you buy yourself more time to raise another two or three or as you are driving enrollment. And that's bringing tax rates down, as we saw earlier. And over time, we have the new school building. And at the same time, we're doing well by the taxpayer and have to jack tax rates up to something that's completely unaffordable. That's the idea. Jim? If you can keep it brief, please. Yeah, keep it brief for the taxpayers getting into some 30% increase. Um, we're going to stick to the um, policy. I'm going to go to um, the last page, I guess, and I'm going to go to the homestead, the definition page. Um, the homestead education tax rate means, uh, let's see, um, no, representative taxpayer impact means for any school district physical year, the percentage of the homestead approved the tax rate for a homestead with a groundless value of $400,000, income of $150,000, and excluding all other factors impacting such calculations as January 1st, 2023. So I just hope that, you know, what I'm getting here is, is that, you know, and the reason why the four hundred thousand dollars is is because anything after four hundred thousand dollars, you don't get your prebates and rebates from the folks. You don't get it. Right. You pay full boat. So they're not guaranteeing you the sixteen percent on anything above the four hundred thousand because that's what it says here. Okay, so you're all screwed anyway because you're gonna you, your taxes are your values are gonna go up 30, 40 percent. So just picture you're gonna be paying on that. What I'm getting at here is, is that another thing that you're bringing up, Ben, and the other one I said it was that you stretched the, the payment out from 20 years to 30 years. But, but let's be honest here, the $75 million bond, what you're really saying is I want to go out, Jim, and put up to the voters for a $75 million bond to get this building going to lure people in. Well, some people may say, you already voted it in, so you guys are already stuck with the payment. I'm not going to give you any money. That's just one, one thing. The other part is, is that the $75 million, half of it is actually just for the building. The other half of it is for stuff inside, which is, some of it is technology, which we all know that my old phone didn't <clears throat> mean that what last year is already shot because it's an iPhone 14 this year or whatever. So you want to stretch $30 million worth of goods inside of a building that only have a lifespan of 10 years to 30 years? You, you, you have, this is, this is just, I'm sorry, but this policy, it took a lot to write it, but to me, it's smoke and mirrors of trying to make somebody feel happy that it's not going to understand what it's doing to their tax rate. I'm done. We're, we're, we're not talking about the specifics. So the number, no, the number is, you, the number, that, that was specific, but the number that you're talking about with the technology, we're not voting on the bond. So the example for that, first of all, I think is closer to $5 million for the furniture and technology in that in that price that you see there, the 75, about 5 million, I think, is for furniture and tech. That doesn't have to ever go on the bond because we're not talking about a bond right now and we're not voting on it. We could decide as a board if we're only going to put the building in it, right? The building and utilities, and they're not willing to roll the cost of furniture <laughs> and tech into the bond, you know. So I'm just saying, like that to me, that's a bond conversation. Your point about the 16 percent, 400,000, I agree, is in the policy. The the tech and stuff to me is a separate issue because that's that's bridged across if and when the, the bond talk, you know talk is up. That's all. So my basic question goes back to do that. What we're looking to do is go to the taxpayers this year for two point something million to go and get more studied on on what exactly the building would cost and the plans. No, it's uh, to get the project shovel ready. You yes, have to have well, it's plants. That's going to act two fifty and a whole bunch of other stuff. Okay, some of that, but yeah. it's mostly like blueprints in order to be able to get well, the construction. I said, plant, I said plant. So if you, you want to call blueprints? I said plant. It's not a study. Okay. okay, so so you want to spend two point six million dollars of taxpayers' money without going to them and even asking them first that they want a seventy five million dollar school. Ludicrous. Let me spend $2 million of your money 
to see without asking you first if you want the school. I just want to ask you for $2.6 million to get more plans for some architect and engineer to do stuff. I, I, I just, and then you get that passed. How long does it take to get shovel ready? I'm going to stick to the pot. Mm -hmm. So we get the 2.6 million passed. How long does it take to get those blueprints to get to be shovel ready? Yeah, approximately a year. A year, okay. So now the cost of that 75 million yeah. has gone up another six or eight percent or whatever the Elliot gave us. Or whatever. And then you got to go from there. So the 75 million is another $4 million, $79 million. So it's $80 million in a year and a half. Away. I'm going to call the question. I'd like us to move on because I don't see that this is helpful or. Um, Yes, for the taxpayers. Let's call the question. Let's call the question on the first reading here, tabling the discussion for the on further talk, but we're it's a first read. So we're not voting to pass it tonight. And I think perhaps there are other people who have questions now that they've read it. And we need to move forward in our meeting because we still have some things we have to do tonight. I'm going to make a motion to table the capital debt repayment policy due to the fact that nobody has a red copy in front of red line copy in front of them. There's going to get a second. There's no red line. What's the there point? was a red line. You're talking. Oh, about no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I told you. I'm, I'm messed up. Again, <laughs> okay. I'm going to make it because it doesn't make any sense here. I make a motion to table this and Bryce with his 16% that he's backing me up on. I think you need some more information in here and get out specifics, such as the 400,000 and 150,000. That's just a so, so tabling that, tab, tabling the reading tonight just moves it to another time, correct? Right. And let Bryce go through or, the 16% or whatever. If we vote down tabling, it we just need to get some second. Mm -hmm. Are we asking for a second to talk about it next time and get further clarity? The table the first read, and this one is time sensitive. I want to be able, we want to be able to tell the voters at the March bond uh, vote that we intend to take forward um, that we have this policy in place. To but is the policy, I'm confused on what it is, though, personally. So this is just this is the first read. It goes there back. can be additional reads, I guess. Any clarification on that? So even if the this. Even if next meeting goes to a second reading, there can still be modifications between now and then. Just I don't. I don't understand what the first reading is. Are you, what are you asking us to do? Are we asking to build a school for seventy-five million dollars? Are you asking? No, for no, no. We're looking at the capital debt repayment policy, which limits the, the um, impact on the taxpayer to no more than sixteen percent. So, so what we're doing is we're reading it tonight, and at the next meet, and the next meeting, we would like to have a second reading of it. And get questions answered between now and then, and continue the discussion so that a bond can be proposed for March to fix the roofs and do the projects and hire a, a, a contract. I'll make a motion for a second reading for clarification. Can there be tweaks in between first and second? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. I make a motion for a second reading. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Any opposed? Okay. Um, ben, was there anything more you wanted? Uh, from that's that's policy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Building to grounds committee update. I've been <laughs> out for two months, and Joe, take it from there. I'll be as brief as possible. We uh, got all the new heating systems up and running. All the buildings have heat, which is a good thing. Um, we'll continue to work on our energy uh, projects in the school. We're currently wiring all the schools for our building management systems, so district wide will be able to control everything. Uh, we've done some tweaking over at the high school to kind of hedge our bets on the steam system. We did some work in the tunnels down there a week or two ago, got things up and running. Uh, all our solar systems, Prosper Valley, Woodstock Elementary, and Reading are currently up and running, but they're not online just yet. We're waiting for a final inspection through the state. Uh, we hope to have that here by the end of the month. Um, and as Jim mentioned, um, we're working with some engineers to move forward on these grant funded projects at Killington, Reading, and quite possibly Woodstock Elementary. 
Any questions? Is that cool? No, thank you. Um, negotiations, hiring, retention, committee update. Uh, it is uh, a, a final um, uh, proposal is being uh, presented to the ESP uh, board of, or union to vote on, um, and we are very close to finalizing our um, negotiations. That is all. Okay, thank you very much. And I know that um, the configuration enrollment growth work group has a brief presentation about um, proposed names and Aiden. And oh, and our student members of that committee are going to speak to that. Oops. Perfect. Um, thank you, Ms. Christo. So um, good evening, everyone. Um, Owen and I, along with the uh, Configuration and Enrollment Working Group, have been working hard with um, the district names. We have been, um, I know we mentioned in a previous board a meeting that we brought a made a survey that we public met, um, sent to the public regarding our district name. There has been some concerns around its relevance to our identity and our location. So um, we were just trying to filter in some suggestions to see what direction we want to take with this. <laughs> and um, from that survey, we got a lot of good suggestions and um, we decided to filter it down to the schools to give more concise uh, name suggestions for possible name suggestions for our district. Um, different schools did in different ways. I know some elementary schools did different competitions, just some friendly stuff with some light rewards. I know the middle school, high school did a survey uh, regarding different names that they liked and or if they did wanna change it overall, if they just wanted to include, uh, keep the same name. Um, and uh, we took the results from all the schools in our previous uh, committee meeting, which occurred past Thursday, November 3rd. And um, we voted down and narrowed it down to three results that we voted to, that we believe identify with our school district and our geographic location the best. Um, and Owen has pulled up a so slide with does this look vaguely correct? I have the Zoom capabilities of a founding father. Is this, is there a teal presentation yes, happening yes, here? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. good, okay. Okay, now, now Aiden will um, we'll talk about this. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, so um, we have, uh, we originally divided it down to four, but we had to make some adjustments to three because one of our name suggestions was um, already taken by a different district in uh, Vermont. So um, I will talk about the first one that you see, Mountain View School District, and then we'll touch upon the other two. So um, this possible school district name uh, came from the Killington Elementary School. We're not exactly sure from what class or what student, but it originated from that school. Um, we voted on this name I mean, we considered a lot of factors when doing so. One of the big ones is, is geographic relevance. Um, as you know, uh, we live in a state that is predominantly, you know, a big geographic um, feature in our state are mountains. We're surrounded by mountains. We live in the mountains. We live in valleys. We live on top of mountains. I mean, mountains are all around us. And a lot of our um, school activities and, um, you know, a lot of our features of our district revolved around, you know, mountains. Like we have, I know in the elementary school level, we have the ski runners program, which is, I believe it's starting up again this year after it's been uh, postponed with COVID um, where, you know, you get to go skiing. Uh, elementary school students have the choice to go um, among other winter activities to go skiing at the suicide, um, uh, not, excuse me, Saskadena Six, mountain um, every Friday, I believe during the winter. So little activities like that really help shape an identity in our school and our district that's very unique from other districts in our state and in the country. Um, it also recognizes all of our towns more instead of Windsor Central being more directed towards our county, which does not include all the towns in our district. Mountain View has an aspect that's shared by all of our towns, that being all of our towns include some sort of mountain, whether Killington being, well, Killington Mountain, 
or uh, plenty other mountains in the towns of our district. Um, so that was a very popular name and we feel like it has a lot of relevance in our area. Now we'll uh, pass it over to Owen. Cool, cool. So neither you nor I want to hear my voice anymore tonight. So I'm going to be fast. Um, the second option we were looking at was Riverbank School District. Um, this was one of my personal favorites. Uh, I thought it was, it was pretty concise um, and, and definitely relevant. So this came from the high school, middle school um, kind of crowdsourcing campaign that we ran last year during advisory sessions. Um, this we thought was uh, pretty inclusive of all of our towns given the significance of rivers like the Ottaquichi, but also um, various brooks and the, the White River running through North Pomfret. Um, it also has kind of a metaphorical use of whatever river banks are, are places of growth and development and um, you know fertile grounds for ideas to be seeded in, um, and also geographic significance of for example, the high school, middle school being quite literally on the bank of the river. And then uh, thirdly, Calvin Coolidge School District. So also from the high school, middle school, the advantage of this is its recognizability. Um, there's certainly lots of districts that are based on geography, whereas in Vermont, at least there aren't that many that are based up, uh, on historical figures. It has historical significance. This is a you know unique, figure from within our jurisdiction as a, as a district and someone who was certainly significant. I would say maybe a disadvantage of this is um, tying our horse or, or tying ourselves to one horse here with like someone's legacy could, could certainly change with time. Um, so, you know, certainly has more potential for controversy than yeah, many other but we'd love to hear, um, you know, just open it up for some, some brief, discussion, uh, what you guys were thinking. Those were our, our three favorites, I think, after voting on it and deliberating a little bit thus far. Well done. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm going to I'm going to leave my camera off. I've been terribly ill for several days and you do not want to see what I look like right now, nor do I want you to see what I look like. Um, I wanted to bring up my concern around the Calvin Coolidge idea in a time where we're really trying to expand our inclusivity and diversity, um, choosing the name based off of a white male, um, as Owen referred to, uh, historical con historical context can really change. Um, my research on Calvin Coolidge, while he was a great president, there was some questionable um, uh, uh, work that he did around uh, African-American people of color and also um, uh, Jewish immigrants. So I, my vote would be to do the Mountain View as my first, Riverbank second, but I do think that we should stray away from uh, naming the district after Calvin Coolidge. So, so the plan is at this point is we're not asking for a vote tonight. We are going to put it out through the various media options to say these are the names we're considering, um, and not we're not asking the public to vote, but we're seeking input, and um, then we will likely bring it back in December with um, our particular choice and why. We'll show you evidence. Um, on that, but um, I I hear what you're saying Anna, about Calvin Coolidge. It is um, hard to find accurate information about all the things that some some pros and cons there. Well, Terry. Yes. I think first Calvin Coolidge. We probably have to get permission to use the name Calvin Coolidge, but to help that out and everybody else of us trying to build a new school. I don't know, why don't you go ask Calvin Coolidge to clear his name and donate $75 million and then the school after him? Uh, well, isn't that the idea, trying to go to rich people to find a school? So um, I don't, I think um, it would be helpful if you uh, board members would like to send uh, input around which <clears throat> name you would prefer or not prefer, and we'll keep that in our mix of collection of information that we're seeking. All right. Thanks to the, thanks to the, the students guys for hanging out for so long. I truly appreciate them. Well, we offered to move it up earlier, but they said since they had the day off, they thought they'd be well rested. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. 
but they didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> we really tested that, didn't we? Well done. Thank you, guys. All right, we are now at the uh, consent agenda, and I do need to make one. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, no, go ahead. <laughs> Last uh, presentation, Marlene, you want to come in? No. So I wanted to announce a uh, uh, new build working group that the... Uh, Are you going to explode or do you not? Yeah, I got it. Uh, you can, well, I'll, I'm going to pull one up and then you can... You can actually, I'll, I'll do that. That'd be fine. Um, the, let's see, the website, we've got a soft launch. Prototype of the project website is up for the board's review. You can get to it off the district uh, website. Hold on, let me just show it real quick. I can get my Zoom to pop up. Come on now. Um, here we go. Okay, so uh, yeah, here we go. This is the uh, project website. It's looking pretty good. And uh, the first thing uh, we've got on the is an about page. Uh, not to to drain this. Just wanted to show everybody. Uh, there's an FAQ page, and this is, uh, you know, a lot of the questions that have been, been uh, you know, asked for a long time. Uh, you can look at those FAQs. It'd be great if board members could take a look at that stuff and give us some feedback. Uh, some of the, um, you know, uh, info about you know, giving from the fundraising standpoint. And uh, the leadership team uh, here that's been working, you know, incredibly hard for a long time on, you know, a lot of the things that you've seen tonight, and then also, uh, you know, on fundraising. And um, I guess the um, takeaway is that at the next board meeting, uh, for all this discussion about uh, bond votes and uh, all that, um, the committee will come back um, with this timeline and ask for the board's endorsement endorsement of the um, the March bond vote for the planning documents um, and our, uh, you know generally to, to endorse this this timeline we'll have we'll have time in the future um, to go you know, for the uh, for the March 24 bond votes that doesn't need to be made next month but we're coming up on March we need to get um, those votes um, those uh, you know, warning items out uh, in time for the next um, uh, town meeting. But um, on the fundraising, I uh, wanted to turn it over to Marlena McNamee, who's been you know, heading up the, the, the fundraising um, subgroup of the working group uh, with an update. And she's got a presentation that I will pull up. And uh, Marlena, if you could take yeah. us through it. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to try to be very quick. I am the um, part time fundraising manager for the district. I've met some of you guys, um, seeing some of you on Zoom. Um, we can go to the next one. Um, just quickly tonight, just going to go over our fundraising to date, uh, fundraising timeline, a potential timeline, um, yearly goals, table of gifts to give everyone a little bit more comfort to how you structure a campaign and the goals. Um, there's actually a like a method behind it, madness. Um, a little bit on the donor cycle and then the next steps. This looks longer than it really is. Um, so we, um, that's actually, that's actually a picture of the website. Ben wasn't on the landing page. There's actually a video and images. Um, maybe some of you have seen it. Um, so just wanted to point that out. Um, fundraising work group, we have over um, 20, uh, 10 volunteers um, in the, in the work group, um, not the new, then, then there's also a new build group too. Um, and they've been wonderful. A lot of spouses, um, have helped uh, that are on this board. Um, their spouse has been roped in um, and they've been lending their expertise. Um, we've play, created a lot of collateral materials, website, donor materials, and we have secured 1.7, a little over 1.7. So it's under 2 million. And that is, there's a, there is, that includes a $100,000 uh, commitment that came in uh, in the past month. So, um, and we're in the earlier stages, um, but yes, then go to the next. Um, Here's um, kind of where I think the milestone should be. Um, this was um, kind of going on, okay, these are the milestones that have to happen in order to, you know, to make that bond model work. Um, so 
I would project by that by December of this year, we'll, we're, we're going to have 2 million. There's several gifts in the works. I think that, you know, in January, if we're not at 2 million, it's kind of like, ooh, a little bit of trouble here, you know. Um, December 23, that would be right before bond vote in March um, 2024. I think that we need to have 5 million. That would be bad if we didn't. Um, and it's just kind of like a checkpoint, um, so to say. Bond vote, um, hopefully in March 2024, new, new school built, 25. <clears throat> hopefully we have at least 10 million by 2026. So, and then uh, 12 million by that year. So this is just, I, I don't know if I really want to get into this. This just kind of showed you guys each year how much is the minimum that would need to be raised um, in order to make the bond model work that Ben showed you. So, um, you know, we already have nearly 2 million and in next year we need to raise 3 million. Um, gifts are easier to get in the beginning because they're usually from donors that are more connected. Um, they're also, you know, the, the larger donors as well. So you're gonna, you're gonna be compounding quicker. And then in the other years, I'm projecting that we need to at least raise 2 million each year. So it's gonna go down a little bit. And then as you get, you, as you go into a wider net of donors, you're gonna be actually raising less and getting to about, you're gonna total about 12. And that's kind of the bare minimum. Um, you know, it's hard to say exactly, you know, how it will go, but I'm pretty comfortable with those numbers. Um, our overall campaign goal is $20 million. So if you go to the next slide, and this is um, our table of gifts, which is off of $20 million. And actually that's cut off, um, this one's cut off a little bit, but however, um, you can see how many gifts are required at what level. So um, this is also another kind of like, this will make sure that you don't, yeah, sorry, it's, it's just a little funny. Um, yeah, there, there you go, Ben. Thank you. Um, so, so for every prospect that maybe could give four million dollars, um, we would need for every donor who would give. You need four potential prospects. Industry standard says three to five. So I, I did multipliers of four. So for every one of those gifts, you multiply it by four. Just to let you know, we have a pipeline of prospects. You know, it's. It's not a huge pipeline, but it's far larger than the 65 prospects needed here. So there's even a buffer on top of that. Um, you can see what gifts we have received to date, um, two in the $100,000 plus and one that's over or at 1.5. So, um, but this is, this is very traditional campaign model. 90% um, of the gifts are gonna come from 10% of donors. And um, and then vice versa. So you're gonna, it's like an inverted uh, pyramid. So um, and going to the next slide. Oops, sorry. So you, you might be like, you know, this takes time. And I think everyone's pretty understanding of why it takes time. You need to identify the, um, you need to identify the potential donors. You need to qualify them with meetings. Are they interested? Do they have the capacity? What other, you know, competing forces are there? Then you need to cultivate these donors. Um, that would be, you know, would you like to name the, the gymnasium? I'm just putting it out there. I don't know if that's actually, you know, or the greenhouses or, you know, um, or, you know, do you have any restrictions around your gift? Like, let's talk about specifics, what interests you. Um, and then you come back with them with more of an ask. So that's a solicitation. And then stewardship is thanking, thanking, thanking um, these donors. And you can actually go about it again in a reaction. Some of these folks will be asked again for gifts um, too, and they, you know, they're they're kind of used to that. So we have a lot of donors that are sort of stuck in the the cultivation area right now, actually. So that's why you know I'm pretty confident that several of them will move through um, pretty quickly. And you know, we only work with about ten donors a time kind of that we're focusing on really hard um, because it just takes so much time. I mean, that's it. You know, we have this list. You kind of prioritize who you're working with and where they are in the cycle. So. 
And um, so I, I thank you guys all for helping me um, to identify different um, prospects and donors. Um, many of you have helped me. And if there's others, um, please reach out to me. Um, you know, if you if you know someone, um, you know, or you could help open a door to a donor, that would be very helpful. Um, you know, continue to advocate for the new school with your community, the grocery store. And then I would recommend that, you know, that there's more of an FTE for a full-time fundraiser <laughs> funding of some sort next year um, or so. Um, I think this model is working out well with volunteers, but it's just going to get harder and harder to fundraise. It could potentially as you work through folks who are kind of easier targets. So, Awesome. Thanks, Marlene. You're welcome. That is the new build committee update. All right. All right. I think we can move to the consent agenda. Motion to accept the consent agenda. Second. And All right. I have one the... amendment for it uh, that I would like to add to it, and that is that in the attendance at the, the last meeting on October 3rd, under the principal of the administration, John Hansen was also present. He came in a bit late via Zoom, but didn't get the mark present. So and, I'd like to do that. And, and before we go on, can you at least give a little bit on the uh, resignations and, you know, get public and thank mm -hmm. them and everything else? We have two resignations. We have a special ed teacher at the high school who is new to us, who has, um, has resigned and will be resigning in December. And then we have our our, our teacher, um, Michelle Hopp, has resigned her position. Okay. So we thank them for the time that they were with us in our district. All questions. Okay. Um, all in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 <laughs> all right. Um, public input. Is there any public input? Hi, I'm Roger Rivera from Killington. I want to apologize for speaking out of turn before, but I want to pose that question to Ben again, that he has his projections of students. I think that he should, or somebody should reach out and find out how many students you think you're missing currently and what kind of enrollment you think you're going to get out of this. Secondly, you guys, I heard talk of a $7 million bond. I think you, my guys, should, in your effort for transparency, Separate the bond issues into the into the actual capital improvement bond and a separate bond for your 2.7 for your new build. That will give the public a clear identification of which bond items they're willing to support and which ones they're not. I think it will also give you a clear idea as to whether or not they're going to support your school. That's all I can remember for right now. Thank you. All right. Thank you. At this time, I need a motion for an executive session. So the executive session is for a purpose, for a purpose of a, a student matter. I'll make a motion to go into executive session mm -hmm. for student matter. Thank you all. Thanks for saying something. Second. Second. So good night, Ellen. Good night, Amy.